Hello, hello. Hey, let's bring these uh, these lovely smooth jams down. Uh, to those of you listening, that was uh, Game Chop Zelda stuff, which is absolutely exceptional. Hello, greetings, Wato, and welcome to the very first, I believe, at least digital IGDA Indie Showcase. Hello, one and all. Uh, my name is Will. I will be your host for today, and it is my esteemed pleasure to be here bringing you a myriad of exceptional indie games. Now, obviously, in years past, this would be held at a, a cool little GDC function or a, a fancy place. But it's 2020, so it's coming to you from my makeshift bedroom studio. So, if there are any technical hiccups or oddities throughout the day, we're just going to pass that up to mm, this. Um, but I do want to say again, like... Thank you to the IGDA for inviting me to host. I've got eight cracking indie games to show you all. And ah, uh, it's really hard not to start the show by just telling you all of them at once. But just as a quick overview. So friends, to start, we have Neko Ghost. Um, then we're going to go being... Blah, 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 blah. There were some great English words that I used. We're going to start with Neko Ghost, which I'm going to be playing for your lovely selves. Then uh, some of the team working on a game called In the Black will be joining us for some hardcore sci-fi dogfighting action. Um, then I'm going to be showing you Old World, which if you've dabbled in games like Civ, Age of Wonders, Crusader Kings 2, you can be very keen for that one. Then we have the last Epoch, which... Oh, how to describe it other than one of the uh, the lost children of Diablo 2. Um, we're then going to be jumping in a game called Under, which is like layers of fear with a whole World War One thing going on. Uh, I played a little bit of the demo last night and it spooked me. So I'm looking forward to showing you, but I'm not looking forward to playing. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Uh, we have Externus and, oh boy, like, I want to tell you about the turn-based tactics elements. I want to tell you about the, the narrative driven, but all I can think to yell is Corgi Knight. Corgi Knight. Uh, after that, we have Potions. Um, potions is your initial RPG affair, but sans the combat. You play a potion maker in a, in a very, very... Um, uh, and a very, very well-trodden RPG universe. It's, that's feckin' fascinating. Uh, then we're going to be going to the Epic Tavern. Because, I mean, by that point, I've inflicted four hours of indie games on you. So we all deserve a pint. Uh, and then after that, I'll be joined by uh, Renee, uh, IGDA head honcho. And the very reason that I got to talk to you throughout today about indie games. And we'll be chatting about today's games, talking them through. Now... Usually, I'd be very much here for directly talking all of your ears off, um, but we've got a lot of games to cover today, and as much as we have four hours, I have like half an hour for each game, so please forgive me if I'm not directly answering questions, if I'm just speeding past. Um, we are going to have like a proper Q&A section at the end of the game. At the end of the game. Uh, let's have another slick of coffee, shall we? At the end of the day, and from there, we're going to be... Um, recapping a bunch of the games. Now, as per usual, uh, any of these games that have Steam pages available uh, will have links for you to check out. Please, like, follow and wishlist any of these titles if you get the chance. That really helps these titles out. Um, yeah. So, we're going to be starting with a game called Neko Ghost. And the thing is, I could describe to you what this game is about. I could tell you about space cat pirates and how their abilities to travel through the warp fail, creating a temporal distortion that rips bodies and turns a bunch of pirates into ghost pirates. But honestly, it's better if I just show you. Oh, uh, to Burgos Games, you are correct. Sorry, my apologies. It is Neko Ghost Jump. But you know what? It, uh, this is just going to be easier if I show you. Now, there is one thing that I want you all to bear in mind throughout all of today's showcase. Every single one of these games may, at first glance, appear to be very similar to things you've seen. Or may appear to be kind of like a, an interesting art style take on titles you're well, you're well familiar with. Wow. God, I need to get better at those whole English words. The thing I'd like you to bear in mind throughout today's showcase is that every one of these games 
is exceptional. There's a there's a twist, there's a hook, there's something. And again, like it's it is my genuine pleasure to to dive into these little titles and show you. Um Neko Ghost Jump is absolutely no exception in this. So bear with me while I'm just pushing buttons. And let's begin. Oh, and do let me know if the uh, the cat noises come through uh, have feckin' very loud. Okay. There we go. So, again, I could describe this game to you. I think it's better if I just show you. <laughs> Kitty's so in love. What could possibly ruin such a beautiful day? It's space pirates! It's pirates in space! Can we just appreciate how happy these pirates are to be doing their daily pirating? Just, just wanted to point that out. Ghost pirates now. I don't know if I did. I mention ghost pirates. I'm pretty sure I mentioned ghost pirates. So to recap, the love of your kitty life has been stolen. Your, I assume, cat grandfather figure has just has has given their life to save you. Um, the, the stakes are high. But, I mean, at this point, you can understand, like, it's got very much a, a Goyman the Mystical Ninja kind of thing. No. No. There we go. It's got a, a Goyman the Mystical Ninja kind of flavor. A very, very cute, bouncy, bubbly aesthetic. And honestly, that would be fine. But I did promise you there'd be more to it. But bear with me in a second. Um, if you do get very into this title, the amount of customization for your kitty is exceptional. But I've, I've not unlocked anything yet because I wanted to show you this from the from the beginning fresh. Okay, sorry, bear with me a second. I, I'm being informed by our our lovely tech team that uh, it's a little loud, so I'm just going to bring that down for just a second. Uh, hopefully that didn't uh, blow anybody's ears out. I do apologise. I'm just going to get into it because again, this is this game is exceptional and. It's just easier if I show you. Also, this this tune is going to be in my head for weeks. Right. Okay. 
So again, nothing too dissimilar. And honestly, when I started playing this, I got massive, massive flashbacks to uh, Jazz Jackrabbit. Look, we found a kitty, saved a kitty. Oh, pee in a bin bag. Sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. We're gonna completely pretend that didn't happen. The platforming is a lot tighter than it might look. It does take, at least at this point, a little... A feck! A little bit of concentration. <laughs> Hi, my name's Will. I'm here to host the IDD and Showcase. Now watch me fail at platforming games for 20 minutes. Sorry, just gonna speak heresy on the IGDA channel. Okay, there we go. So at this point, there's nothing that really leaps out, right? So why is Will talking about this with such enthusiasm and in such keen? Now I get to show off. Well, okay, show off Neko Ghost Jar. All right, just let me show you. Now the game begins in earnest. Ah, oh, crud! It's a wall far too high for our tiny kitty legs to jump over! What will we do? How about we take this to the third dimension? Yep. We're gonna be messing with uh, geometry a whole bunch to solve puzzles, move through. And while I am not a programmer by any technical discipline, uh, this must have been bloody hard to make. I just realized I don't actually need to collect all these coins as uh, I'm just here to, to show you. Yeah, the compulsion is great. So, there is no way we can make that jump even with uh, a cool little shifty side maneuver. So, heck it, let's just bring it back into the... This, I was gonna say, let's just bring it back into the second dimension. Now, those of you who played like titles like uh, Fez and similar will be familiar with the the general concept, but the execution here is fucking exceptional. So we've had our Neko, we've had our jump, and how about a spot of ghost? And to, to add the third dusting component into our little adventure, alongside our 3D messings. Aha! Friends, I want you to know, last night I spent 15 minutes on that single bouncing jump trying to get that first time. <laughs> so if it looked like I knew what I was doing there, I absolutely do not. <laughs> Alright. So now we find ourselves in the land of indigenous venomous... I'm going to call them evil plants. I was going to say a bad word then and I didn't. Um, how should we handle these? With ghost powers! Haha! Because obviously my ghost pack's not just a fish, but a swordfish. I'm sorry, I'm a sucker for I'm a sucker for easy puns. All right, now let's see if we can wreck this little shop of horrors, Mother Hubbard over here. Aha! Bring it on back. Wait, that's the wrong dimension. I need to go in the dimension of the living. Oh, uh, Burgos Games. How do I turn on cat sounds? Uh, is it a setting that I have failed at? Uh, Burgos, if I'm failing to show up your title properly, do let me know. Like, I have spent... A lot of time playing this since yesterday, and I do want to make sure I'm showing everybody all the, the feckin' shining bits of this game. 
kindly taste my Necker Hadouken. Fearless, I'm trying to be a professional here. All right. No. The cow is safe. Up! Oh! God darn it! Ah, okay. So, Burgess Games, I will make sure we get the full kitty sounds. Settings. Sound. Cat sound FX. Why would that ever be turned off? I am Burgess Games. I am so sorry. Now we're ready. Yes! Sounds of Ghost Cat. <laughs> Sorry, the sword fight is actually really, really hard. I don't know why I said actually there. You know what I mean. Okay, now we're cooking with gas. <laughs> oh! Hey! We're just just gonna we're just gonna not count that as a as a do over. Okay. Uh, so Burgos Games has been uh, the creators of this title are in chat at the moment. So if you want to to chat with them, you've got uh, a you've got another like. 13 minutes of banter, but they were adding that some people did have a problem with the cute cat sound, so they added the option to toggle them on and off. And as much as I would usually joke about uh, cat noises and whatnot, like I really do appreciate that. Oh, crud. I know I said I was gonna get a do-over. Can I have two do-overs? Is that allowed? <laughs> Just gonna. Talk about my failings as a ghost cat sword warrior. Friends, I do want to say, please do not take my failings of platforming as uh, as a slight against this game. Uh, both in kind of 3D and 2D, it's very, very tight controls. Oh, uh, which I guess is where the the, the Goman the Mystical Ninja. Why am I like this? Why am I like this? <laughs> Will, could you come be uh, an IGDA host for an afternoon? Sure, no problem. I know video games. Mm. <laughs> it's just, I keep getting uh, very, very, very overconfident. Sean was saying harder than Cat Mario. Well, if Mario gets a bloody sword, then he can comment. At least this cat gets it done. Despite having repeated out-of-body experiences. But again, the narrative for this is, is very, very adorable and very, very approachable. But from a technical standpoint, it's Incredibly impressive. Alright. Would you look at that? I managed to clear that level first time. First time. First time. Alright? Alright. How are we doing for time? Oh, I've got ten minutes. So now I can actually uh, play a level like, uh, like I mean it. 
Uh, now, if I, uh, if I am correct in remembering, there is a Steam page up for this game. So, if this is something that interests you, please do head on to Steam. Do throw this onto your wish list because right now that's one of the best things you can do to help indie titles. Alongside, um, oh, that's turning into the dead. Uh, alongside, uh, giving this game a... Oh. <laughs> no, that's... I keep pushing throw my soul out of my body. Oh, I think I can make that, yeah. Why jump when you can run? Oh, no! I forgot about the ghost cats going, yo ho ho! Yo ho no! Yeah. I am being informed that I'm not allowed to pretend like that was the first time I played this. We can't just pretend that this is the first time I've done all of this, no. No, okay. So I apologise I don't have anything clever to add because this is absolutely one of those games that speaks best for itself. There's nothing I feel I can add or, or say that really needs saying. It's an incredibly technically clever title and I love the accessible art style then used with something that makes me go, oh, oh. I guess any of us that uh, were brutalized by Mario Sunshine in our youth will very much understand that. Alright. <laughs> Sorry, uh, so I was, uh, Ninja was pointing out, oh hey, it's Super Paper World. Did it. This is Neko Ghost Jump, thank you kindly. This is distinctly not a... I can assure you this game features me in no capacity whatsoever, which if you've seen my platforming abilities so far, it's definitely a good thing. again in real time. Alright, I'm gonna do this like I mean. I can't just natter on incessantly. See, I can do it when I'm concentrating. Sorry, I, I apologize for, for casting my eyes downward. I have uh, all of your lovely selves down here on chat. Uh, and I'm seeing a lot of familiar names, so I do want to thank all of you for coming out. All right. How did that not own me any more pause?
forget the ghost can just fall. Oh, and to, uh, to well, I guess Slifter and Barbels. Uh, the art style of this is hecking adorable and. It definitely does a very good job of. Um, I don't want to say of subverting expectation, but. This game is not to be taken lightly, and again, don't let its adorable art style fool you. Um, as I said at the beginning of this little a little indie showcase, all of the titles here have something special, and, well, aside from this game kicking the heck out of me, which is obviously a comment on my failings, not a comment on this title, um, the mechanics of this title are just exceptional. And honestly, honestly, it's all I can do to not get completely sucked into this game and ignore all of your lovely selves, which would make me a terrible host. Um, I believe uh, the devs of this game were mentioning that they had been at um, a few of the... They've been at PAX East and PAX South, like, earlier in the year. So, some of you... Uh, Traditional PAX Congoers may have already seen this on on show floors. And to uh, to the specific commenter asking. As to uh, my Fall Guys abilities, uh, obviously I have no crowns in Fall Guys because I've been too busy being an adorable cat ghost swordsman. Or swords person, I haven't actually uh, specified. Oh, and to Trevor Oz, I absolutely agree. Um, the the flip from 2D to 3D must have been an incredible technical achievement. But I will say, and I hope it comes across from my, my gameplay of, that it's incredibly intuitive. Um, for something that's very evocative of, you know, games like The Messenger and Fairs and things like that, games that leap between two different, well, not genres, but two different spheres of playing, it works so smoothly. It did not take me long to figure out a large portion of the uh, the puzzles and mechanics, uh, even if I am failing at them in front of your good selves. <laughs> We're going to be uh, leaping onto our next game in the indie showcase because honestly, if you all gave me as much time as I want to talk about all of these games, this would be an 18 day event with sleepover. But again, friends, throw this on your wish list. I can't say enough good stuff about it, both from a technical standpoint and from an Egypt ginger behind the camera playing it standpoint. So, once again, friends, that. Neko Ghost Jump. Right. So now, um, from from one title to the next. And again, friends, uh, if you have any questions about these games, if there's anything that I haven't got the chance to cover or talk about, um, myself and Renee are going to have a little like a, a little coffee wind down and chat once we've gone through the entirety of the of the showcase. So do stick around. Um, but now we're going to be leaping. From Neko Ghost to the cold darkness of space. Um, so bear with me just a moment as I bring up our wonderful guests. Okay. Hello, hello, hello. 
Hello. Hey, Jack, thank you so much for coming. It's lovely to meet you. Oh, absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting us. Right, let me get your, let me get that wonderful video we have of your, of your wonderful title. <laughs> I'm trying to be vaguely resembling a So, Jack, thank you for joining us. We are going to be chatting about your title, In the Black. And I've got to say, as a Tide Fighter kid, not an X Wing kid, but a Tide Fighter kid, the entirety of this title is Now, do you want to give these lovely people a quick overview of your game before we start the Sure. Old school. Uh, we all started back in the day in the '90s in the game industry. I worked on the Mech Warrior Two titles. And sorry, I'm sorry. What? To... I worked on the Mech Warrior Two titles. You can't just drop that. And th uh, okay, no, please continue. Please continue. We're coming back Mech to two? that. Do you play yes, Mech Two? Yes, I played Mech Two. <laughs> so, <clears throat> no, sorry. Uh, professional host Will Overguard. Uh, please continue. So I loved I loved combat sims, and I also uh, I went on to lead design Far Cry and Crisis. So I love realistic looking things. So that's kind of where my interest uh, was. And one of my partners, David Westman, was actually one of the level designers on X Wing, X versus Tie, and all of those games. So we've been friends a long time, and we always talked about making a game together. And we came up with this idea in the black that. We looked at all the other space sims, and most of the other space sims have a lot what we call hand wavium in them, where they're, mm. the science fiction is not hard science fiction. They'll have things that uh, really are not possible. I mean, they, they're in the realm of fantasy, warp speed, things like that, late, you know, force fields that stop kinetic grounds, um, anti-gravity. All these are things that physically you really can't do. So... We, we uh, had a, uh, a, a, an expert in physics join our team, Zach oh, wow. El-Hajj. He's, uh, he's now getting his doctorate at Notre Dame in physics. And he everything we do has to go through him as far as realism is concerned. So we simply ex extrapolated whatever we knew for today and put it 200 years in the future. And we tried to come up with a compelling game that's set 200 years in the future. Okay. And that's it. That's in the black. You play a mercenary. <laughs> Although, um, sorry to derail it a little bit, uh, I do believe that Tim Curry promised us that space would be the one place not corrupted by capitalism. How come that's never the case? <laughs> so, uh, I'm trying to uh, to not go complete fan over the uh, the back catalogue of titles you worked with because we do have a limited amount of time, and I do want to sure. talk space space. So. Um, a lot of the other titles that are aiming for space realism at the moment are going for the for the grand scale, are going for the the over arc. Uh, what inspired you to go for that classic kind of squad v squad dogfighting? We wanted to play something that we ourselves loved, and uh, I'm a big fan of World of Warships and World of Tanks and War Thunder, and a lot of our team members are big fans of War Thunder. And also Counter-Strike and League of Legends. So those little five base squadron games appeal to us the most as far as getting in, getting into a 15, 20 minute battle and getting out. No, that's splendid. Um, and I believe as a, a larger portion of us who are uh, fans of especially like the old X-Wing TIE Fighter titles. Sorry, I've just I've got to say it again. TIE Fighter was the better game of TIE, TIE Fighter and X-Wing. Just got to say. Just got to say. Oh, and that is Julian, your, uh, one, part of your team. Yeah, Wes Maniac. He's in the chat. He's, uh, he was the mission design and lead writer for all of the X-Wing series. So he definitely helped that bring yeah, that to life. And that we're real proud of that. Um... <laughs> so one of the other things that struck me about this title from from watching through all of the stuff that you came uh, that you sent to us was that um a larger portion of this game has been designed with space combat in mind rather than trying to emulate fps i noticed that um using your uh, your kind of your capital ships as a refuel uh, a refuel and reload operation allowed you to play defensively which isn't something yes. i've seen in a lot of 
I'm just gonna I'm just gonna hand wavy him uh, spaceship games because I feel if I start doing sub genres, I'm gonna eat up the entirety of this interview. Um, how did you start coming up with a bunch of those like even design philosophies? Uh, well, when we sort of the realism as our core drove everything we did, it drove our mission design, it drove our weapon design, it drove our ship design, it drove our, um, it drove the, the, all of our missions take place initially around the Saturn space because we wanted to pick a place that was varied and still deep space. And, uh, that gave us a lot of moons to work with. And then when we designed our capital ships, we're like, what would an actual capital ship be using this hard science? So, you know, a lot of a lot of spaceships that are that size in most other media are designed sort of like submarines or ships where they have decks that are uh, horizontal. But what we learned is that you would absolutely not design a ship like that. You would have to design a ship that looks like a skyscraper. Because when you go under 1G gravity, that gives you normal gravity on the ship. So that's the one way you would have gravity on the ship is when you're moving. Ah. So we tied all that into our ship design. And we also looked at contemporary weapon design. David Westman especially is dropping articles from the Department of Defense every day for us to look at about the latest. What's the latest ship design? What's the latest naval laser they're using just so everything we do we always incorporate that into our design and um it our ships went out and they were dying really fast and running out of <laughs> ammo really fast so we had to have a an area that's a repair rearm and uh reload area then we have basically you have nanobots that are fixing your ship up really quick and you've got all your missiles get put on and you get fixed back so we needed to put that in there because some of our ships were really uh, basically had aluminum foil for a skin. So they would get damaged really easy. And you certainly run out of missiles really fast because we don't have it that you have, you know, a black hole or bag of holding that you're pulling missiles out and shooting. They actually have to be mounted on the, the ship and they're actually physically there. Which, I guess, uh, opens up the opportunity for small ship just covered in missiles. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, but, well, that would blow up pretty fast. <laughs> well, okay. But that is something worth highlighting. Like, aside from the challenges of, like, armor, like, how have you managed to balance that hard sci-fi element with gameplay? Because video games are not easy to create, and sometimes users right. can be less than forgiving if they get shredded repeatedly. Like, what are some of the other challenges that this hard sci-fi has presented you? Well, we, our ships are actually, they're not, uh, you don't just take a mesh for our ship and have hit points applied to it. Our ships are actually systems. They have, each have components. So they have an engine component, they have a gyroscope component, they have fuel tanks, they have a cockpit, they have electrical systems, a computer, all those are different components. And you really got to kill the ship can take a lot of hits depending some guns it can like if uh, if you get hit with a we we call it our gatling gun if you get hit with our gatling gun you can actually take a ton of damage with that and it just shreds you and the armor helps but if you take a shot from a rail gun a rail gun just passes through everything it's like the ultimate weapon but it's almost like using a sniper weapon it is super hard to hit ships with that gun uh, also all the ships are equipped with uh power systems that are coming off the nuclear reactor on board and it all has a thermal uh harking them back to the days of mech where we had you know we had overheating everything has a thermal system and all the sh all the guns work off a thermal system and you use a laser too much it'll overheat or if you use your gun too much it'll overheat and eventually it'll vaporize so that's how we balance nobody just coming out and spamming everything and we're finding the battles are definitely we're getting with the little strikes, those battle those those last pretty quick. They'll go out in five to ten minutes. They'll be dead. But we do allow players in our our mode that we have now that we call blood sport. It's sort of like an esport of the future where the, the okay. pilot pra they practice their their wares uh, and they get paid for it. But you don't really you can do things like respawn and do things like that that you wouldn't have in real life. Uh, eventually, we're going to offer the PMC mode that is going to have permadeath, and you have to actually earn everything. Ooh. And when you go out, if you take that out, that's going to be, you know, it's going to be super, super hard. But Ooh. the people that are really good in that, uh, we have found that the more you fly the ships, 
you get so good that you're hard to kill. Like our our lead programmer, Noah Brewster, he's a monster. No one can kill <laughs> him. Him and uh, and uh, uh, Remco uh, Vandenberg is our uh, lead technical artist. He's also a killer. And when you see those two on the same team, you're not going to get them unless you get a lucky missile hit on them. So uh, one of the big things, obviously, are missiles, and that's one of the most important weapons you have. We had to balance that, so we said, okay, we can't use force fields. What are we going to use? So we did research, and we found out ships all have something called a CWIS, or close-in weapon systems. Okay. Basically, they, they'll have a Gatling gun with a radar on it, or laser, or uh, LIDAR, and it'll detect incoming missiles, and it'll shoot them out of the air as long as you have that ammo. So all our ships are equipped with that to start with. And you can, Ooh. you're okay for the first God, three so or sorry. four missiles before you're you're out of ammo. No, I did notice on one of the instructional videos uh, ahead of time. Uh, sorry, one of the instructional videos was talking about use of like uh, rapid fire weaponry to shoot down missiles. I thought that was fascinating. Uh, also, yeah. I must apologize for a second. Now I did cover um, as I am. I'm scrambling behind the scenes to get your trailer ready to show these lovely mother. Hey, take your time. I'm good. You can cover me up. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, the thing is, and as I was saying at the beginning of the showcase, is that all of the games here have something special to it. And if I had to, if I had to do a, a quick shot of espresso pitch of this game, it's the, you know, it is the Counter Strike of dogfighting games. Now, don't yep. get me wrong. I love a good sugary space sim. You know. <laughs> you know, eat a bag of Harry Bow and then fly around in an X-wing and feel very powerful. Um, <laughs> but the the feeling, that grounding, that hard science definitely gives this a, a very special edge. So I'm real glad we're getting to show this off today, and I want to do that Thank right um, and not be a completely useless host. So <laughs> I apologize if I'm making. You're great. Noises. I'm having a fun time. Thank you. No, no, and it's lovely to hear uh, the elements taken over from like classic Mech Warrior, X Wing, things like that. Because I think now that we're reaching this point where games like yours can reach a massive audience, you don't have to put it in a box on a shelf in GameStop. That it means that this <laughs> game can reach idiots like me who are going to lose many hours of sleep playing this until four in the morning. So thanks for that. Yeah, we learned. Uh... This, this as a dream game for uh, Dave and myself and Edmar and the rest of our team. This is a game publishers probably wouldn't put out because it's it's niche okay. and they you know usually they go for the bright and shiny, and this is hardcore nitty gritty and and our game was a slow boil that means we are we've been working on it you know we designed it for three years basically just prepping yeah. on you know getting all the back stuff, and we're because we all have our sort of our day jobs and we do this on the side. Some of us, it's their full-time job, but a, but a few of us are like, I teach on the side and I do this for the rest of the, the Indeed. Well, actually parts. one of the individuals who worked on Neko ghost jump was actually mentioning that you were one of their, their tutors of past. So uh, your students are here creating <laughs> games alongside. I um, love my students. <laughs> also, if you, if you don't mind me getting a little into the, uh, the industry weeds, I do also remember that, that period from like, I want to say like 2005 to basically when Star Citizen broke everybody's brain, that <laughs> all publishers were like, nah, nah, people don't even want space games. No, space games don't sell. Oh, no, no, I can't do that. <laughs> Funny that. Yeah, I well, I mean, if you look back in the golden age of PC games, the hmm. space games were the king of the games. I mean, you had X-Wing, you had Wing Commander, you had uh, Freelancer eventually, you had Privateer, which was one of my favorite games. Those were the games. And what's funny is now that we're getting into the, the era of VR, there's no game that suits VR better than space games because you're in you're essentially in a cockpit when you're you know when you're sitting at your desk and you have your controls in front of you and you're looking all around and and we at alpha we were vr we haven't uh, uh done a lot of vr development since alpha because we were focusing on the main game but vr works really great in our game and it looks fantastic because we're such a realistic looking game well that and, was uh, that was one of the things that a few of these lovely mother hubbards in uh, uh watching were asking about was is there going to be vr support 
I'm going to take that as a yes. Uh, we would love to. It depends on if the game is successful or not. If we can, if the core game uh, does enough where we can support, support ourselves on it, the VR will be one of the first things that we jump on after that. Mm. And if you we want to do VR, we want to do VR. It does take a lot of bandwidth to, to do it right. It does, it does. And considering the care you're putting into so many elements um, throughout this title, you wouldn't want to do like a, a, a half-baked VR. No, my, my lead programmer, my lead artist, they don't let us do half-baked anything, which makes me <laughs> sad sometimes. <laughs> True. Because they are such perfectionists that they, they will hold it until it's so ready to go out. And, uh, you know, I love them for that. I love that, the, you know, they care so much about it. And they, they put so much of their, their own time into it that it's uh, – it's, we, we would not put VR out if it was uh, half, half done. We're going to do it right. We're gonna, and that means controls and – everything not just joystick controls but oculus rift controls or whatever and those have to be specially designed for Indeed. a space sim but as um as we've only got you for the half hour uh let's get into the fun stuff because i've got to admit the idea of having a theoretical design session where you're going through kind of like the concepts of hard science that's got to be a ton of fun dude sorry to be it just, sorry to just use this as an excuse to nerd out about cool spaceships but feck that's got to be awesome <laughs> Uh, it's definitely a part that I love. I mean, speaking for David Westman, who's uh, who's on the chat, he is so into that. Like I said, we get a daily ex uh, operations man. I love. I mean, speaking for David Westman, who's uh, who's on the chat, he is so into that. Like I said, we get a daily. Uh, operations manual from a, uh, a plane or something or we get a, the latest you know uh cell video from the department of defense i'm 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 surprised they haven't shut us down yet with all the stuff that we have moving over our our network and all the like i wouldn't say classified but i'd say nearly classified <laughs> Close uh, to. yeah and the when we did the i mean we've got a really really extensive game design document that a, a lot of care went into the real world weapons and you know we looked into detail at materials that things would be made out of superconductors are going to be a thing of the future so we had to plan for that there's things like reactive armor that you would find on modern war tanks that we definitely know that um that's something that we would have in the future that we would be associating with spaceships because they're not quite they're not really airplanes and we, you can't build it like an airplane you have to build them almost like a tank the way they're used and the way they, the way they the way they operate because some of them you know our heaviest ship now the the hyperion uh that is a weapons platform that is a monster and it, it can carry 20 missiles it can carry four rail guns it's heavily armored the engines are massively huge it burns through burns through fuel like a 57 plymouth plymouth uh and uh you know we went into detail on every single aspect of it, every single component we did the science on and we we try to keep it as near as possible at the end of the day i must say we do if we have to err on the side of science or gameplay we do err on the side of gameplay when it comes to making the game so as, as much as we love all of the hardcore stuff we do we definitely know we still have to make a fun game Indeed, in the same manner that one probably shouldn't spike a uh, an AWP sniper rifle into the ground to pass it to their friend, you know. <laughs> there is exactly hand wavium is still allowed in the uh, amongst the hardcore. Yeah, I, well, we did get the uh, the atomic rocket seal of approval, and uh, the atomic rockets. I don't know. If I'll give a little plug to those guys. They are a website that specializes in looking at the science of space battles and there's physicists and uh, it's totally very impressive people that are on that site and they only we and kerbal space program got the seal of approval so we're pretty proud of that <laughs> that's very very cool um although i do still check feel... that site out you'll like it <laughs> i do still feel guilty for how many kerbals i've killed oh uh, one cosmonaut <laughs> is just going atomic rockets so <laughs> i'm officially learning now um, okay, so let's, you know what, um, let's get into the fun questions. Although, if any of you lovely Mother Hubbards in chat do have any questions, please feel free to act uh, IDDA while asking them. Um, so, 
Money No Question, uh, a Mr. No Strings Investor drops an infinite bag of money on you. What is one of the, the, the features you would love to throw in in the future? Ah, uh, that's a great question. Well, Only in I the definitely... event of the infinite bag of money. Yeah, the infinite bag of money, we would definitely get as many ships as we could in there. So we would need like a team of network programmers and they're pretty expensive. <laughs> so if we could get a game that's 10 v 10, 15 v 15, 20 by 20 with our components. And of course, we've got real physics gameplay and we have to replicate all that over a network. If I had a team of programmers, I definitely would do something like that. Also, we have a pretty small art team, only about four people. I would I would boost the art team up to massive levels. And I, I'd like to have the number of ships in our game that you see in something like War Thunder. Like they have oh. thousands of planes and ships. So if we could if if we could have that many and there is extensive tech trees and things like that, I would love to have that. That would be that would definitely be something I'd yeah. look for. Also, there was a couple of features which I don't know if we've covered that I did want to highlight, which is I don't know, this seems like a weird thing. But it was something that I always wanted, again, going back to my TIE fighting days, uh, that they added with X-Wing Alliance was the ability to just go and have a fly around. And I know that's such a teeny tiny feature that you've added, but I can't Yeah, instant enough. action. <laughs> instant action. So you can just jump in your ships that you own. Because you, you actually have to buy your ships, and you have to earn it. When you, when you first play the game, you're on your initial mission, and you get a, enough money to buy like the cheapest Shrike with the cheapest gun and the cheapest engine. And you'll always make money if you take that into a mission because you're, it's always gonna be uh, enough in, you know, our our game is called In the Black and that's also a term that financers use to say you have money left over when you balance ah, your spreadsheet. So, I have been looking at your game for the last two days and I can't believe it took me that long to realize. You know, I think that's more of an American thing because a lot of our guys on the team uh, who are, we have a lot of guys in uh, the Netherlands working on our team, they didn't get it either. And they didn't like our, like oh. our title was initially, our title was initially Starfighter Inc. And that's the one we really liked. But when we went to do the trademark, it turns out uh, another company already owned the trademark for that. So we couldn't use the word Starfighter. Okay. So we had to scramble for another idea and, and In the Black came to us and we liked it. It had kind of a double uh, a double meaning. Okay. Um, so uh, I'll go uh, back to you. You're in your ship. You're buying yep. your ship. As you play missions and earn money, you can buy more weapons and more ships, and you can upgrade your hangar space and get bigger ships and, and uh, a variety of ships, a variety of t styles of ships. You can take all those into an instant action mission and just try them out to see how well it works. And we have a concept of rental ships where, you know, for a certain amount oh, of lovely. credits, for a certain amount of credits, you can try out ships that you don't quite have yet. Okay. So you can get a get a little little uh, feeling of the future. So, yeah, we're built. We built that instant action mode so you can quickly jump in and stuff. That's lovely. And uh, Noah <laughs> wants to even actually add in the ship editing area he wants to have a quick jump in area where you can actually jump in and fly the ship too which we think is a good idea and we're we put on the backlog so we're going to do that eventually so too. that is lovely i have a couple of, of quick fire fluffy questions for you um sure. ship customization question mark yeah uh initially we have a we call it delivery and there's a lot of customization uh remco uh and noah designed our ships to have you can have multiple colors on them, multiple color schemes, multiple patterns that you use on them. You can even change the color of your cockpit glass. You can change the color of sensor materials. You can change the color of the lights that are your little navigation lights. Really, really customizable uh, aspects. De we don't quite have decals yet. That's something on our list that we'd like to have. Certainly, that's that's but something. But that's more of a technical if, challenge rather than. A... Yeah, if if Mr. Moneybags came, we would say, yeah, we want some yeah. uh, we want some decals. We are working on ship customization, full ship customization. We're talking engines, uh, nuclear reactors, uh, computer <laughs> systems, targeting Sorry. systems. I apologize weapons. for laughing. It was just. I plan on having the gaudiest ship possible, um, as I'm not going to be very good <laughs> as I've destroyed my reaction speeds over uh, many, oh. many years. So I've got to have a good looking ship. And when you said customize your reactor, I was like, I think I'm going to go for mint. Yes, a, a mint trail. 
fresh. <laughs> uh, the the uh, uh, we had uh, one of the guys. I think it was Noah built. We have one of the ships. It's called a Pegasus, and it's like our our version of the of a of a of a Hercules Lockheed. It's a ship that's you can Ooh. do with a lot of different things. They made some called the Party Pegasus, and they have like <laughs> all the navigation lights will actually look like disco lights, and it's all these colors. And it basically you see it coming from a billion miles away. And it it was one of our most popular ships, even though you're trying not to be seen. They want to have, be splashy, right? They want to be cool. I so, didn't even yeah. realize Party Pegasus was a thing I needed in my life. <laughs> you need um, it. So yes, in the future, I will abuse the fact that we were on an interview together to get a party Pegasus. Just, just letting you know. Um, You'll be able to build it yourself. We, it's not something that's not like a, uh, it's not, it's something that's gonna just come with the, the customization. Well then, so you'll be able to build a target party Shrike. Ooh. Um, <laughs> I built okay. the bat. I built the bat Shrike. That's my favorite. One, so <laughs> <the bat> Shrike. <laughs> Didn't Prince write the... No, that was the bat dance. Sorry, I get those two mixed up. Um, I have some quick-fire question for you, if that's okay. Um, sure. uh, is there going to be any uh, harvesting, hauling, or escort missions? Uh, no harvesting. We're not going to put people on a 9-to-5 job. We're mercenaries, and we're paid to shoot, and we're paid to not be shot. So there will be... There are es escort missions. Okay. So no harvesting missions. What was the second one? Oh, the second one... Uh, will there be a story mode or carrying narrative? Uh, yes, our PMC mode, our, our long-term mode is going to be our story mode. And we, we would, our goal is to put out a single player experience like once every one to two months that's going to introduce new weapons and ships. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to further the storyline. And one thing, that we're, one thing that we're playing with is we're going to track all the multiplayer games. And essentially in this first season, we've got two sides. We've got North Star that is our Boeing of the future. And we have Leith that is a um, kind of a, a, a clandestine uh, corporation that's, that's uh, fighting to get purchase in Saturn space from North Star. So they're kind of like the bad guys, yeah. but there's really no bad and good in our game. It's all shades of gray. Indeed, and, indeed. And with Saturn prices the way they are, like, honestly, can anyone just afford to get space in Saturn right now? Like, honestly, Saturn gentrification is a topic we really should be talking about. <laughs> right? In our in 200 years in the future, North Star has the controlling interest of Saturn. There's some other corporations. Uh, there's a corporation called Song that's oh, a, a Chinese sorry. corporation. I apologize for interrupting. We should get through oh, a few more of these. Um, sure. Uh, just because someone was asking how big are the matches at the moment? 5v5 right now. Okay. Um, is it just going to be PvP? Uh, we do have AI, and you can. There are some co op missions in our game. We're playing, we like co op, and we're playing with co op, and we're probably going to build on that. Right now, there's a couple of co op missions. Okay. Uh, and that was our quick fire. So we've got we've got a couple of minutes before we move on to our next title. Is there anything you'd like to to add before we bring our our mercenary dogfighting segment to a close? Uh, we just want to invite, I think, all the users here. We've got a Discord channel that we're bringing everybody in, and we love people to join us. And we're giving out keys for people to play the game. We're really close to a beta. And uh, we just want to get as many players as possible because we're definitely into in, uh, iterative design and we are responding to what people like and what people don't like. So, you know, the more the merrier for this, uh, this party. Well, um, I will once again abuse my powers. Uh, if you could hook us up with a key, that'd be great. Wink! Um, <laughs> I'm sure we can get you one. <laughs> uh, if you cast your eyes into chat, dear friends, uh, Frisky Donuts has posted the link to the Into the Black Discord. And so for follow-up information, do head on over there. Um, He's our community manager. Yeah, yeah community managers represent. <laughs> Sorry. He's great. Um, Jack, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, half thank an hour you. is not enough time to cover even half of the things that you brought up in stories. So, Beck Warrior 2, you can't drop that in it. <laughs> I'm one guy. Um, <laughs> however, Jack, thank I'm you glad so people still like Mech 2. <laughs> oh, hells yes. Um, but no, thank you so much for joining. Uh, I do apologize that we didn't play your trailer in full. Uh, I will be grabbing the uh, the YouTube links and blasting that in our little Q&A show at the end. Um, so apologies, that is on me. But again, this looks glorious. 
Thank you so much. Thank you much. very much. It was a pleasure meeting with you today, and <laughs> I love your enthusiasm, and you definitely are the, the type of person we, we're building this game for. So only great I was meeting you. good at them. That's the downside. I have the key. Well, to... you can be a support ship, too. You can just be a guy sits in back that's, that lets uh, – you can repair and you can refuel. So you can just be a refueling tanker if you want to, and, and you'll be all right. In the rear <laughs> with the gear. Um, Jack, thank you again. All righty. Okay, so dear friends, uh, from the depths of out of space to the old world, we're going to be leaping between titles, and if you bear with me just a second, um, as uh, like a professional host, uh, I didn't actually prepare the trailer for this next game or the last game, so just uh, bear with me a couple of seconds while I get that downloaded. Uh... But our next title is Old World. And if any of you have ever played a title like uh, Age of Wonders, Civilization, uh, any of the uh, Endless series, uh, you'll recognize a lot of the, the core hallmarks of this. But once again, as I keep saying with the titles we have, there's something special about every one of these games, and this one is no exception. Um, this blends a lot of uh, Crusader Kings-esque like family intrigue, betrayal, support shenanigans with a hex grid generated world grounded in history i am i spent two hours playing the build last night and by the end of it uh i had a wife a very very ugly baby uh, my brother was attempting to raggle control of my armies from me uh whilst me and my forces were off making friends with the danes uh, having started a few fights with the Numidians. But in my defense, the Numidians were right next to a whole bunch of diamond and gold, and I'm not making much sense here, am I? Friends, our next game is Old World. Um, now, this one is available to wishlist on Steam. Actually, is, uh, is it available on Steam? God, I am being a terrible host today. I'm being a terrible host today. So, I tell you what. I tell you what. I'm just... I'm just going to drop the trailer in here wholesale and show you all and hope to the old gods and the new that it doesn't blow anybody's eardrums out. And then I'm going to jump in game and just show you. The thing that struck me about Old World that was so very, very interesting is that it's absolutely uh, a game of nuance. There's a lot of elements that you will recognize from other titles, but the, the blend here is real subtle. I was trying to grasp for a whiskey analogy, and it's just not happening. Okay. Wait, no, that's Externus. Feck! <laughs> I can assure all of you lovely Mother Hubbards that... Um... Oh, no. Uh, they. There we go. Old world. Uh, I can assure all of you lovely Mother Hubbards that uh, if it wasn't for... The current state of 2020. This would absolutely be going smoothly. This isn't me being a feckless idiot. Not at all. Not at all. Oh, uh, Trevor uh, uh, OSZ. No, you are correct. It is up on Epic at the moment. Not on Steam. <laughs> uh, I can... I can hear the IGDA peeps being like, Oh, dear Lord, why did we bring this ginger on here? Travis says, one can play if you show extra externus. Okay, okay. Externus, you, you are coming up. And it's going to take every fiber of my being not to just holler a corgi knight at the sky. But this is Old World's turn. Okay. The other things about Old World is that you basically pick from a lot of kind of like the... Um, the... Oh, what is the fancy history term for the Romans, Greeks... Carthaginians, the, the the birthplace of European civilizations. God, I am. I tell you what, if I if I fail to use one more term, I will hand in my host card. I will print out a card that says Will is allowed to be a host, and I will hand it in. Right uh, after that desperate padding, uh, friends, I have the trailer for Old World here. I'm going to drop it in. And I do apologise if this comes in very, very loud. So brace thine selves. 
Coming from the veteran game oh, developers dude. who brought you Civilization 3, Civilization 4, and Offworld Trading Company, Old World is an epic, turn-based, historical strategy game that puts you in the role of the founder of an ancient empire. However, you are now more Every turn, you get a year older, and so eventually, you will die, and your children will take over. You are not just founding an empire, you are now founding a dynasty. In Old World, characters are very important. We have a robust, dynamic event system that creates memories and relationships with your spouse, your children, your vassals, even your enemies. The decisions you make echo across the game, leading to unexpected places, so choose carefully. We have created over a thousand unique events, many inspired by history. Some are famous, some are more obscure. Choose from seven founders of seven empires and inherit not just their strengths and weaknesses, but their family trees as well. The order system fundamentally changes Forex gameplay. Instead of moving every unit every turn, spend your orders to move them however you would like. You can spend them all to explore distant lands, to fight a war, or to complete a great wonder. Old World will be available in early access on the Epic Games Store before summer. Okay, so without further ado, friends, let's just jump straight into the game. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Magic was saying if this is a, a simplified sieve, I'd be excited. Well, again, this is... I, I'm someone that absolutely adores and consumes, like, 4X games, civilization building games, the whole shebang. And this is kind of fascinating as a title, because it is and isn't. There are elements of... There are elements of this title which the, the game handles far better than a lot of other games of the same persuasion. It also allows you to go down to a personal level. Your family plays a large proportion in the, the overarching strategy of how you play through this game. And, oh, hang on. Gameplay, gameplay, gameplay. Uh, one thing that I will be asking, friends, is that as our family tree uh, propagates throughout this title, I will be asking for polite names. Oh, and if you, once again, friends, if you cast your eyes towards the chat, uh, Mohawk Games, that's Soren Johnson, is the lead designer um, of Old World, um, and will be answering any questions and helping us through this. How are we looking? Lovely, lovely. Oh, God. No. No! I was trying to look at Mohawks. Oh, and um, uh, Mohawk's comment was that the term I was looking for was classical antiquity. It was. It would be far better if I'd been able to pull that term from the air when I needed it. Uh, so I'm just going to throw in with a new game. Now, you'll have to forgive me if I go for the Romans, because that's who I've been playing. I've played, like, two campaigns of <laughs> this already. Um, however... Unlike Civ's kind of uh, global grab bag, this is very much uh, civilizations of antiquity. So we have the Assyrians, the Babylonians, we have the Carthaginians, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Persians, and the Romans. Um, unlike a lot of... Um, Paradox titles or creative assembly titles, the map is also randomly generated. So, friends, if you want to go wild with how many opponents, the construction of the world and where it is, absolutely. Uh, I do believe that the pre-made maps is an option, so I guess we could go for the old world. But the old world's boring! I know where everything is! Let's make a new world, and then take it. <laughs> yes, I will be playing as Willemus. <laughs> Apparently. Sorry, I was just casting my eyes downwards. Ah, Epic Tavern. I see you uh, lovely folks lurking there. We will be coming through there at the end for a pint. But that's for later. This is Old World. God. Friends, can you tell I'm a little bit overexcited today? The only problem I'm having doing this role as host is I want to talk about all of these games simultaneously. So do forgive me if it seems like I'm Tokyo drifting on conversation topics. Okie dokie Loki. Right, welcome to the old world. You are King Romulus, see Willemus, founder of Rome. A young nation in the old world. 
A world full of established powers that do not yet respect you. What? Right, well, let's get set up. Um, so someone was mentioning earlier about the simplicities uh, of civilization-style elements, and it certainly does have that. Um, it's very, very clear when setting up your capital city what you'll take over, what you'll get from it, and how to go about it. Ah, now, orders. Now, this is the bread and butter of this title, which is something I find fascinating. Uh, each unit has X amount of movement, X amount of actions per se, but for each, we'll call it turn, although I believe year is the term used uh, in-game, you have so many orders, which means that you can take a particular unit and push them far beyond their, their movement range or attack, but that does consume additional orders beyond their initial. It also means if you have tons and tons of units, you do have to specify who you're telling what to do. Uh, and again, because uh, Beodora was asking Mohawk uh, uh, in chat if there will be modding. Uh, friends, the creators of this game are lurking in chat, so if you have any questions, do throw them in there. Uh, I won't pretend to, to speak on their behalf. My job is just here to show you this game and wreck face as the Roman Empire. Um, okay. Quarry's definitely the way to go. Alrighty. Ah, oh, decisions, decisions. Fish, farms, shenanigans. But let's get us a quarry up. Oh, mine will do. And a farm. Or send some scouts off on an adventure. Ah! I, I'd love to say this was planned. It absolutely isn't. So you see this glowing element here. Now, for those of you that played inordinate amounts of um, Age of Wonders will be familiar with the idea of um, uh, events found throughout the land. This is where it gets interesting. Okay, nothing super bombastic here, because some of these events are brilliant, but we found a veteran, sorry, a scarred veteran soldier crouching in the ruins. She says she once commanded the armies of a great nation before a resistance brought it crashing down. She is willing to share her vast battlefield knowledge if we're willing to listen. Ooh. Okay, so we have two choices. Learn from her military techniques, in which we acquire military drill ballocks technology. Eh, whatever. So-so. Invite her to lead our troops. Bodicea the Bold becomes a great soldier. Hmm, let me see. Bodicea has joined our forces. So, uh, now if we have a look at the court... Oh, where's the one that shows the, the full court? God, you wouldn't think I'd play this a whole bunch. Uh, so we now have in our court Prince Remus, our brother, who's a crumbum. I'm just going to say it now. But we also have a Boudicca, or Bodice... Sorry, the pronunciation of Bodicea has changed throughout my entire upbringing. So forgive me if I say it like three different ways. Um... So we now have ourselves an additional hero that can be put in charge of one of our armies. Oh, I also need to change myself to Willimus, because, let's be honest. Uh, and if any of you want to suggest a name for our treacherous brother, please keep it polite. Uh, I wanted to call it Venture Capital Investment, but I felt that like, might be a little too on the nose. Oh, butts, I'm out of orders. Uh, I spent my orders willy-nilly like a fool, and now my scouts are grounded. Uh, however, what we can do for our warriors, I believe, is assign them uh, a hero. Oh, we might need to wait till next turn. So we can put Bodicea in charge of that army and just go wreck face. Trevor is saying, Billimus sounds like our evil brother. Done and done. Now, it might seem like I'm overly focusing on the, the small customization elements, but one of the places where Old World shines is matching the kind of the grand scale of expand, command, and conquer, alongside actually having to manage your, your family relations. As anyone who's done five minutes of history will know, you can have the greatest armies in the world, but a treacherous sibling can undo everything and pop a wee knife in your spine faster than anything else. Uh, so this was a Billimus. <laughs> Is it... Wait. I thought the evil brother was the one with the facial hair. Oh, well, we're just not gonna... 
just not going to acknowledge that. I mean, as Catros is saying, maybe don't antagonise your bro. I mean, if you want to write that down and send it back to all of history, you're welcome. Oh! Centralization or Vassage! Now, these early decisions will shape a lot of how our, our empire expands across this new world. So we have the choice to centralize our power, which means all hail Rome. Uh, vassalage, uh, trusting our subjects to govern, I believe means that new cities we found will have a certain level of autonomy. Uh, we don't decide right now is the, the hangover. Just, just we'll, we'll handle it tomorrow, it's fine. Uh, and the court will choose the laws, essentially moving poor power to the people. So on the one hand, centralization makes us a prime target for betrayal and backstabbery. Um, so disseminating power amongst the people might not be a terrible idea, but it does open us up to, you know, pesky rebellions and, you know, uh, the elements like that. Uh, I'm going to stay central because, uh, sadly, I don't have 15 hours to show you this game truly expand across. Um, so I'm just going to be a mean crumb bum in the early stages. Scouts, go find me someone to smash. In the words of, uh, of great historian Sir Frederick Durst, uh, just give me something to break. Oh, it looks like things we can take up there. All right, add a general. Okay. So, our, our choice of generals... Uh, there's Appus the Tough, an Ola, Ola, ah, okay, I can't even pronounce that title, uh, Prince Bilimus the Evil, uh, and Bodicea the Bold. However, when we put her in the army, she will no longer tutor the royal family, but, I mean, she's a, a an icon, a great British warrior, you know, she can't be sitting around court being all like, doop de doo Oh, and they can't do any more exploring. Oh. So far from crabs. Um, and hopefully I'll have enough time to use them. But let me let me pop another settler on the uh, on the queue. And we do need a farm. Here's a farm. You, sir, are not helping. So let's get you heading down here through potential city sites and continue. Uh, sadly, Beodora, I will not be recruiting a crab army. It is not that kind of history. Ah, oh, Konami E3, we miss you. Okie dokie, Loki. So now, uh, I'm going to send Bodicea up here for perhaps for a little bit of of hunting and gathering. I tell you what, actually, let's send our scout up. See if we can find someone. Oh, and if we want to have more actions, let's. Can I get you marching? Oh, uh, and if needs be, so uh, early on, uh, units can harvest across the map without having to set up bases and things, which it makes early game exploration very beneficial, and it kind of moves you away from that whole oh look I've got one tiny little city I can't wait to sit here for 15,000 turns building a shed you're encouraged to explore this new world which goes very nicely with the fact that you know maps are randomly generated and it it, it gives you that feeling of exploration it's one thing that I've been obsessed with for as long as there have been history games is that we as users often have a huge advantage over uh, over figures in history because we know how it shapes. We know the shape of the globe in all its round glory. So it means that when planning our empires, when expanding, we get a certain amount of like magical, for uh, magical hindsight. You know, we know it's a terrible idea to wage a campaign war in Africa. That's just bad. But with old worlds randomly generated spaces, but still having that grounding of history, really makes you feel like. 
the Empire Builders of old. We don't know the shape of this world. We don't know its choke points, its its bountiful harvest areas. We have no idea, and we're going to have to bloody work that out. And I kind of like that. But, uh, I don't know. Maybe it's just uh, the spirit of, of Bodicea inspiring me onwards. Uh, especially to murder Prince Bilimus. Oh, uh, Beardora was asking if this would be focusing more on diplomacy and getting good airs. Um, oh, not a shrine. That is an excellent question. Let me, uh, if, I tell you what, if there are any questions, friends, that I don't get to throughout this, or that uh, Mohawk Games isn't able to, to answer during this segment, friends, do let, uh, do let us know. As I said, we're going to have like a little Q&A coffee wind down after we've gone through the full showcase. There will be plenty of time for, for questions in the ilk. <laughs> Favour 6 adding. You mean like, never engage in a Sicilian game of death or start a land war in Asia? Exactly. Oh, we found some survivors. Invite them to resettle in our nation. Uh, gain a worker or recruit them as hardened explorers. I'm gonna go for a scout. Um, ooh! We've met the Danes! Okay, you've met your first round of Danes. The Danes can engage in limited diplomacy, but generally won't be coordinated in the way opposing nations are. Finding a weak tribe and claiming their sites for yourself would be an important step towards growing your nation. Nuh-uh! I'm making Danish friends. I love Dane friends. Oh wait, is this an army for me? Aw, oh, now I feel guilty. Sorry, Danes. It's not, it's honestly, it's nothing personal. It's, it's a showcase thing. Uh, the tutorial has given us an additional combat unit just to kind of show some more of the conflict. And we'll have our settlers on the go. Also, do anyone notice that in Neko Ghost Jump we're collecting cows, in Old World we're collecting cows... Um, I probably should have asked uh, in the black if there was any kind of cow collection going on. I'm worrying that there might be like an underlying theme that I wasn't made aware of. Right. Next unit. Hey, cool, you found horses. Aha! You are now known as the Explorer. That's not bad. Willemus the Explorer. Got a bloody good ring to it. Oh, great migration. Uh... Broken uh, vessels and strange markings indicate that these ruins were once occupied by a tribe from beyond the sea. Such a discovery inspires you to expand beyond your realm to new worlds. All right, commission scouts, send them in every direction, gives us two scouts, study this unknown tribe and widen our understanding, giving us a big old science boost. Uh, now again, I'm gonna go for scouts because I have a, a limited amount of this game that I can show you. But this would be a real good way to kind of like jumpstart your research very, very early on. Alright, you. Hopefully I've got enough. Oh! Okay. We have an opportunity for a spot of learning. We've encountered the Domidians. Our scholars wish to study the Domidian culture to deepen our understanding. But our generals insist that these savages deserve no such respect. We must bring the court together with a decision. Um, I've already started a fight with the Danes, and poor little Scoutimus down here is not really going to do much against an Omidian fighting force. So let's observe their ways and traditions. And run past them. Okay. Ah, out of orders. Ooh! Now, legitimacy. Uh, your title has changed to the Explorer. I can't pronounce that, I'm sorry. Um, uh, describing your recent accomplishments. Improving it increases your legitimacy in the eyes of your people. Higher legitimacy grants you additional orders to improve uh, and improves your standing with the nation's families. Keeping your legitimacy high is important for controlling a larger nation. Yes. If our legitimacy was to start to drop, Prince Bilimus the bad word would start sneaking up behind us with knives like Wolverine. Well, because he doesn't have 12 friends to do us like Caesar, so he's got he's to pack them in each hand. <laughs> 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 
sorry, I cast my eyes downward and Shackle Draconis dropping a, a pun about the Dane in laws. If I had time. If I had time. Yeah, let I'll show him who's legitimate. See, little does my Roman family know. Oh, next year. My Roman family know that I actually studied uh, also under the uh, the fellow scholar Sir Vanillian Ice, who was too legitimate to quit to me. Too legitimate to... Ah, oh, feck, I killed the joke. Uh, nation contact. <laughs> You've encountered a rival nation. Other nations are your primary opponents in the old world. However, successfully engaging in diplomacy can lead to gaining a powerful trade partner and ally. It'll be up to you to decide which nations. I'll do my best to make some friends. <laughs> what is Will? What is Tiny Will at school? I'll do my best. I'll try and make some friends. Hey, up, Persia. Oh, wow. Okay, no. Persia's been... Persia's been doing very well. Oh! Interesting. See, now we find ourselves at a teeny tiny crossroads involving one of the other nations. Our scouts have encountered a party of Greek soldiers whipping a man bound at the wrists and ankles. The warriors accuse the man of inciting rebellion, of uh, stalking members of the royal family and attempting to infiltrate the treasury. I mean, at this point, the guy sounds more like Scrooge McDuck than an ins instigator, but there we go. Um, however, the victim insists that he is innocent of crimes. Now, the Greeks urge our men to move along and mind their business. Oh, and to, to Layla J, I apologize that uh, as we don't have a, a huge amount of time to, to show you Old World, I'm not jumping into a lot of the, uh, the history chat. But I do like the... Um, uh, what you were discussing about um, uh, like Egyptian trade routes and elements like that. Because the thing that Old World has is the possibility of discovering those anew, if that makes a, a weird kind of sense. Um, honestly, we can't be nice to everyone. And I'm feeling, I'm feeling emboldened. Let's go save uh, uh, instigator Scrooge McDuck. Because he tried to Infiltrate the treasury. Oh, what? They're sitting on a bunch of tin? Oh, silver even. Psh. Right. Anyway, back over at Roma. Uh, let's see how we're doing. Oh! The barbarian camp has been cleared and we found a lot of food. I'm going to choose to assume that's regular food and not, you know people um so we are we are a civilized sort oh units on cooldown because they've managed to take a city uh, also during our little conversation we did gain uh Calisto the minister and again friends you will have to forgive me as i feel i'm not going to be able to get far enough into finding a wife having some babies showing you the family tree properly expand i i know take my word for it isn't really a a, a great descriptor of a title it's not Soylent Barbarian! Ah, oh, The Emperor's beard. Oh, look who forgot to research stuff. It's me. Let's research, let's research music. As a happy populace is an easily controlled populace. Uh, I mean, what? Okay. Everybody's coming out of the woodwork. I'm glad all the nations are leaping forward while we're while we're getting into trouble. So it's a momentous meeting. Oh, sorry, bear with me just a second. Um Oh god, we are coming right up to the wire. Uh, so we've met a group of Assyrians appear on the path ahead. Uh, as if expecting our men. Removing all weapons, they place them on the ground at their feet. The leader, who speaks our language, expresses excitement over this momentous meeting, offering a gift of fine meat and wine? Hells yes! I'm having lunch and getting drunk! Uh, I mean, uh, yes, uh, it's diplomacy, very important. Sensible business, that, yes. 
Mm, diplomacy. Um, yeah, no, let's... <laughs> thank you for inordinate amounts of meat and wine. Ah, okay. Uh, so, you lovely Mother Hubbard. Sadly, I have to move on to our next game. But again, this is Old World. It's, uh, I believe, currently up on the Epic Store. Um... I really do feel that I need, like, a good two or three hours to show you, friends, the meat of this game. As these story elements unfold, you really do kind of craft your own tale of your own ancient empire. And while it does have the trappings of the kind of, uh, the, the civilizations of antiquity... God, thank you again, uh, Mohawk, for giving me, uh, for reminding me of that phrase. It's just... Ah... Oh, like... I'm getting the one more turn Joneses right about now. Lordy, lordy. Right. But lamentably, friends, we must move on. Oh, and Mohawk Games just wanted to add, uh, thank you for stream. No, no, no. Thank you for your for your patience in bearing with me. Um, and if anyone has any more questions about Old World, Mohawk Games also has a Discord that you can head on over to. Um, as I said, friends, I could wax lyrical about history and video games and all sorts but that will wait for another day okie dokie lokies um so ah uh, next up dear friends we have last epoch oh this is a banger and i have a wonderful guest waiting in the wings. <laughs> okay. Okie dokie Lokies. Um, Daniel, hello and welcome. Hey, how's it going? Uh, it is going very well, but I just need to make sure that I'm not showing uh, space stuff, but I'm in fact showing the last epoch proper b -roll. Hey, I'm a big fan of that game too, so I mean, you know, it's, it's alright if you do a little bit. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Um, Daniel, thank you for coming to join us. Hello and welcome! Totally, it's awesome to be here. It's really exciting. This whole thing's been great. Uh, it's really just awesome to see all these indie games uh, out there and just a lot of excitement about them. It's super cool. Oh, dude, the this whole lineup of games has been absolutely amazing. And the thing that's been killing me is not talking about all of them simultaneously. And your game is absolutely no, uh, no exception. So, friends, um, Daniel is here from the last epoch. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself firstly to these lovely Mother Hubbards? Yeah, for sure. I'm uh, Daniel. I'm the producer for 11th Hour Games. I work uh, mainly on Last Epoch here. And uh, yeah, I mean, I've done game design, a little bit of, you know, I do QA, production, multiplayer, um, a little bit of everything on the project. Lovely, lovely. So I was trying to think of a, a succinct way to describe the Last Epoch quickly. And I can't help but say, what if Diablo 2 but time travel? It's a, it's a pretty great uh, way to put it, I suppose, since Diablo 2 is definitely one of our largest inspirations. Uh, a lot of us really, uh, you know, coalesce around some of the traditional action RPGs in the genre. You know, for me, certainly, uh, it's it's definitely the first game ever that I was caught up late at night at like 4 a.m. My mom came into the room and, you know, found me there playing it late. Uh, and, and I think we've all probably been in similar scenarios playing action RPGs like Diablo 2 or other games like that. So it's, it's very much inspired by that. Um, and time travel is a huge element of the game. So a lot of it, you know, we're not just telling a story in the, the world as you normally would. We also kind of travel between different periods of time uh, as they're represented in the game world. And it's, it's, it's a really great way to kind of expand the universe and tell a really interesting, you know, weave a really... Uh, interesting lore into the whole thing okay well actually let's leap onto that because um i believe uh, a lot of these lovely mother hubbards are, are very familiar with what i like to call the children of diablo 2 um games that were were born of its creation you know your you know your torchlight your um path of exiles and now last epoch but i really wanted to get into that flavorful time travel because 
I don't know. Maybe I'm just a sucker for leaping through time and creating paradoxes. I don't know. But would you mind going into that a little bit more? Of course, yeah. Another big inspiration for us was uh, Chrono Trigger, actually, another another classic. Uh, we really love the sense that you could kind of travel between time to affect different periods. And and here you can see actually some of the content being played. Uh, some of our endgame content we added recently where you can actually view alternate timelines, like what if the world had changed in a different way? And it, it kind of enables us to tell different stories in the world. So we don't just have to tell whatever linear thing we're doing in the main campaign. Our end game kind of enables us to tell any kind of story we want within the world. Like what if something else happened? Um, so so for us, it's important that we, we don't really just use the traditional sense of just, you know, layering chapters on chapters on chapters. Uh, you know, there's like Act 1, Act 2, Act 3, Act 4 in Diablo. We have the opportunity to kind of just go through different chapters back and forward through time so you're not always just going through the same area we have so much opportunity to to just go anywhere we want through time so it's a it's a very exciting mm. engaging uh, element for us to play with and we're, we're learning every day new ways to kind of interact with the time travel mechanic that sounds lovely because uh, and i promise i won't spend the entirety of this interview talking about diablo 2 but i did find myself Kind of, as someone who played Diablo, Diablo 2, Diablo 3, uh, I did find those kind of conversations with Decker came being like, yes, I'd stay a while and listen. It turns out it was Diablo all along. You're like, firstly, I've been playing this game now for 40 hours, Deckard Kane. Secondly, it says Diablo on the box. This is not a revelation. Why are you still here? Just give me the Herodron cube so I can be on with my day. I feel that the power fantasy of these types of top-down action RPG is that is that the correct term would you say yeah you you pretty much have that head on the nose there top down action rpg some people call it isometric action rpg you know i call it good old rootin tootin lootin and shoot you know like <laughs> <laughs> i'm a big i'm a big fan of this genre well i feel that the the way in which these games empower you often undermines a lot of the story beats that we're given and right. especially when it encourages you to to work out uh build combinations equipment that you know, by the time you're hitting endgame, you're basically tearing reality asunder anyway. And so I'm very intrigued by the, the concepts you're putting forward because I think that works very well. Uh, also, just as a quick aside, you are getting a lot of love and respect for your uh, Master Sword and Shields in the background. Just wanted you to know that. Oh, that's great. Good. Those are some epic, yeah, epic drops I got a few years back, so I try to keep them close to my heart. <laughs> it's I... a real sword, too. <laughs> oh, what? All my all my axes are, are LARP safe. Sorry, uh, <laughs> back on track, back on track. Okay, uh, do you want to give us just a, a little more grounding in the world before we go into the into the the actual meat of this game? Yeah, for sure. Um, so you mean like kind of like the story, or do you mean more of like uh, just kind of a, a little bit of an overview about it? I suppose a, a little of the story, a little of the world, if that's okay. Yeah, sure, absolutely. I mean, uh, in our in our world, we're kind of. Uh, Essentially, your character is being set up as, you know, they, they come into contact with the last epoch, which is essentially a tool that enables them to travel through time uh, because there's a there's a long spanning story about an empire that comes to be uh, throughout 4000 years of history. And through their their hubris and greed, they kind of, uh, you know, they establish themselves as immortals or undead uh, to create an empire that lasts forever. But in so doing, they cause their own destruction and you get to experience the world all the way from well before essentially the dawn of civilization through the period of time where that immortal empire kind of came into its power. Uh, then you actually get to travel to a period of time where they've they've essentially achieved that state and it's in a, in a sense of decay. And then there's a final period of time currently that's essentially void ruined and corrupted that the power they use to achieve this empire has shattered everything into pieces. And so you get to kind of experience the world from a state of pure, you know, just uncorruption to what happens as a result of everything uh, from this empire. And and you're you're essentially the last key to being able to figure out what has gone wrong in the timeline and try to make a stop to it. Um, so it's a it's a pretty you know we're trying something fairly ambitious with the story and every day we add a little bit more to it into the world and try to make tell more of that tale as we as we proceed with the game because we have been out for a little bit of a while in early access so you know we're, we're trying to build on to that over time okay um how what has been some of the uh the challenges that you've found from doing this style of early access development if you don't mind my asking well, there's there's a number of challenges. I mean, one is uh, a game like this is very complex. Um, normally, you'll see 
you know, a lot of these games are built in studios together. Um, now this game, you know, when our game director, Judd Kobler, he's probably sitting in the Twitch chat already. Uh, you know, he went to Reddit one day, you know, in 2017 and said, I want to make an action RPG and, you know, kind of got a bunch of people together. We, we started to realize that vision. You know, a lot of us had a collective Sorry. passion. I didn't mean to laugh, but that's usually the story of... Um, uh... That's never usually a story with a happy ending, and yet here we are with a with an actual game, with time traveling yeah. Diablo esque mechanics. That's and a pretty big success. Key... <laughs> it's thank you. Uh, it's the key. I think the key really is that he he really wanted to find like minded individuals, us who are really obsessed over this genre, who you know eat, sleep, and breathe it. Like for me, I'm an ex Diablo three competitive ladder player. Uh, you know, I, I'm 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 very you know adamant about these genres so yeah you know he found people like us got us together you know we had a kickstarter and after we did that we went to early access launch on steam uh which was early last year and we've been live in early access since then with a fairly healthy player base and a great community so uh it's a game like this the challenges it's very systemic there's a lot of elements that go into it different things that interact with each other and break things that feel good and bad because of those and it's really important to listen to your community as well to to kind of get those things right and gratefully because we've been out for a while we've been able to kind of be involved really heavily with our community and and just try to get those elements right and being you know lovers of this genre we kind of know what works and what doesn't and we try to listen to those things uh, and listen to our passions as well and just kind of corroborate all those things together that's lovely although i do want to throw uh, just a, a quick fluffy question at you uh, is there one thing that's been caught that has caught you off guard from creating one of these titles yourself caught me off guard an hmm. element that shattered the the game meta in a way you didn't expect uh, uh, a feature that uh, on the on the initial seemed very simple to implement and ended up being a world shattering headache I'd say something that's really challenging to deal with are actually, uh, say, for example, defensive mechanics. So the way that you you want to build your character, it's really complicated in a way to kind of take and receive damage throughout the game and give a sense of progression and power without it being too overboard. So there's a lot of times uh, we'll find things that suddenly can just kill the player, uh, you know, because of the way we've set up some of these mechanics. And we, we try to, you know, we, we've tried to do things a little bit differently than other action RPGs uh, with certain systems. And, and that's that can be very challenging. You realize that some of the math, some of the things that, uh, you know, have been done and learned, uh, we have gone through and done and learned them. So what we try to do is not try to make the same mistakes. You know, for example, for these defensive mechanics, we've tried a number of different things that we're doing differently, say for with an armor system uh, and damage reduction uh, and glancing blows. And we're making a lot of changes right now even to kind of address and bring those up to speed. So it's it catches me off guard how quickly, despite all of our math, our, our you know, our lead systems design designer uh Trasachi or michael he's he's absolutely brilliant in the way he creates these things but even there with all the planning and thought process that goes into it we can release something despite all of the qa and someone will find a way to just blow the game up no matter what we do so i guess the real challenge is the the thing that takes me off guard is the the emergent design of a game like this is that elements because there's so many of them uh new things emerge constantly that our community will find that we never even thought of and that's the thing that really can take me off guard Okay. No, that was um, emergent design is definitely something I don't think that we at an industry side talk about considering how prolific early access has been in helping titles like this find their space, find their audience. Um, yeah. So I apologize that I took a, a breath and a beat there, but it's, it is something that's worth highlighting in fact if i uh, had if i had your uh, conversational company for more than uh, for more than half an hour i'd love to just get into the whole process of emergent design elements uh, also friends if you have any if you have any questions or any thoughts do at igda and chat um and we'll get to those in the last uh, in the last 10 minutes or so as best i can though it is worth saying that we'll also be doing like a little post show after the chat so if there's any other failed questions that didn't get answered or you know links and whatnot we will be throwing those in so 
No, for sure. And it's a, and, and you know, a game like this, I mean, I, I was joking before I was like, you know, I wanted to show some footage rather than us play because I figured you, you might open the inventory and we might have an hour and a half long conversation about the way we do our inventory system. So oh, gosh, yeah, yeah, games like this can get very uh, complex like that. And kind of going back again to our community, it's really important because there's so many things in the emergent design. Uh, it's critical for us in the way we communicate with our community, and we're we're very grateful. We have a our Discord, you know, we've got fourteen thousand users now, and it's it's we're always in there constantly talking to them. We have an internal tester group now who gets to play the game before we ship the live patch, and we we interact with them nonstop. You know, our community de developer Sarno, I think he's probably in the chat right now. Uh, I was he's been fantastic. Say there does seem to be a lot of your lovely community hanging out here. So uh, if any if any of you uh, last Epoch community members want to give a little teeny tiny wave, you can, you can show off now. You're allowed. Oh, there's, there's <laughs> exactly. Sano there. <laughs> there. There he is. But yeah, it's, it's so important for us. To, yeah, in a game like this, you know, uh, and you, you'll see it in a lot of the other action RPGs. Uh, it's just because it can you can design something that exceeds yourself, yeah. uh, that you listen to the people that are playing it the most. And that's why it's so important for us to keep just engaged with that, to, to just make sure that the things that are working get put into the game, the things that are exciting. Uh, you know, not just the stuff we're, we're engaged about, but what our community is engaged and excited about too. So, No, that's wonderful. Um... I mean, I don't mean to, to turn this onto a, a will-based conversation, but you know, sure. one of my personal feelings at the moment is that to be a successful indie developer right now, like it's not about having you know five hundred thousand players. It's about having a community that loves your game and that you can talk with them. Though I'd love for you to sell five hundred thousand copies. I again, if Mister Magical Moneybags could just drop some cash on this, I would I would wholeheartedly support that. Uh, actually, that leads me on to one of my favorite fluffy questions. All right, because as the producer, money no question. Mr. Magical Money Bags with his magical bag of infinite money just drops it on. What is a feature you'd love to add to this? Again, promising I, nothing, money no question. I'd love to just keep working on the art and the story. Um, for me, you know, improving all of, making everything look nicer, making everything look great. You know, it's it's it already looks so fantastic. Our team does such a good job. And, and for me, I just love, for me, I love the bone crunching, visceral experience of these kind of games. Like, you know, I, that's what I'm really looking for. And if I had no money, it would be the biggest art pipeline you've ever seen in history. <laughs> we would spare no expense. Every piece would be moving. Your UI, you could modularize it in any way you want. Uh, I, I, you know, I just, it would be all about that. Oh, yeah. I, I just feel like the rest of it is good, man. I'm really happy with everything, uh, with that, everything in the project, and I would just wouldn't want to make it, you know, look and feel <laughs> even better. Um, that what, point I, what where else? It stops being a, an art pipeline and starts being a two-track art train cannon. Yeah. <laughs> oh, for sure. And, and so another another thing for me that uh, I use on a previous projects was, uh, you know, one thing we talk, we have a lot of weapons and animations, and it's really key to make sure that animations and weapons feel good. I would love to have a nice big old weapons room uh, to be able to kind of practice those things and, you know, Ooh. test out animations and, you know, possibly even do motion capture would be a really exciting uh, kind of project. So, because uh, games like this, it's funny, you don't think those things matter, but it's those little details. And, you know, if you're going to play this game 100 hours, uh, you know, being connected to your character and seeing the way they move in a way that you enjoy is so critical. So, I oh, know, absolutely. I, uh, also, um, someone going by the moniker of Z uh, Hamster, I uh, just wanted to say a quick hello to you. Um, no, we're cool. Doing hey, guys. Oh, uh, yeah. We're doing great for time. I realized you and I got into the, the weeds there, and I was worried we just yeah. blinked and lost half an hour. Um, no, no, I think we're still good. That's usually what happens when I play the game, but uh, we're good <laughs> right now, I think. Yeah, I, I I mean this with the utmost respect that's going to come out. I'm glad I didn't have to play this for people because it basically would have been like going around your friend's house where they ignore you and play Diablo. I would have been like, yeah, hey, welcome to the IGDA. Yeah, whatever. I'm just having a great time. <laughs> <laughs> you tell it to my roommate when he sees me playing a game like this. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm gone for a few days to say the least. So Actually, um, you touched on something that I wanted to jump on a little bit, if that's okay. So sure. you are an indie team. That means limited budget limited time like you've got a you've got a you've got a bat smart so what are some of the ways that you've been able to make people connected to their character with with limited resources totally that's a that's a great question too is uh what 
the, the key for us is all about the customization of your character, the way you build it, right? Like what that's that's the real progression in these games. And for us, we do it a little bit differently. Uh, I'd say one of the biggest things we do, and it's our probably you know it's one of the community's favorite features, is our skill tree system. So we have planned 140 skills. We've almost we've got about almost 100 skills released right now. But each of those skills has its own individual skill tree. So if you think of a game like World of Warcraft or or another Diablo, like imagine a passive tree. We have 30 different ways to modify each of those skills right now. Uh, so right now we've got live over 90 skills, 30 different ways to modify them. And and uh, with our characters, now we do a traditional kind of system of, uh, you know, classes. There's, you know, uh, an acolyte, which is akin to a necromancer. They actually have a subclass of that. You know, we've got a mage, a sentinel. Now what we do with those is we allow you to kind of choose a subclass mastery. Uh, so say, for example, a mage can become a sorcerer who, you know, you attacks from afar using utilizing spells they want to increase their mana pool to do more damage or we'll have uh they can subclass specialize into being a spell blade who is more melee you know martial art for mm. uh oriented for as well as being a magic user Indeed. i, and just I think wanted those to, uh, apologies for interrupting because i did want to add oh. this uh because uh last epoch in chat mentioned this uh that respecting your character is very easy this isn't yeah. and this is not a diss on the the path of exile but the investment for creating a character tree in that game can be very, very scary, and respecking is a daunting prospect. So I just, I thought that was worth mentioning because it, the it's a good point. I'm so glad they're here. What? Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I'm don't... glad you're here to kind of just uh, check me a little bit. No, no, no it's all good. good. I I pride myself on being able to to translate that that love and that enthusiasm because. I mean, I think that's where we all fell in love with... I'm going to say it again. Um, sorry, mark it on your scorecards for how many times Will's mentioned Diablo 2. But one thing that was so special about that was the wonderful, nonsense, broken things you could create or, you know, crafting these incredible builds. And I think it's a thing that's left us all yearning in a lot of different uh, titles of this style. And, you know, as we are now in 2020 with wonderful digital distribution we can have so many variations on so it's lovely to hear i just felt it was worth mentioning um also oh, totally. um uh bar down beef was just asking uh when will you consider this um when will you consider this game done like will you be adding dlc seasons and they know that's a loaded question but they just wanted to put it to your good self Sure. Um, so our current planned uh, projection for release, uh, we actually made a post about it recently. We're looking at a quarter one 2021 right now. Uh, we're still, you know, multiplayer is actively in development. This, uh, so an exciting thing about this whole thing is that we've been doing all of this. We've got so many players and multiplayer still isn't live yet. And, you know, oh, for wow. a lot of people. They want to crunch monsters with friends, right? So, you know, we're we're working really hard internally right now to kind of get that out into, a, you know, private testing status and then into our game release. Uh, right now we're targeting quarter one, 2021. So it's a, it's, it's, it feels like, you know, it's, it's so exciting that we mm -hmm. have you know, this much community feedback, this much response, and we're still over waiting for, to get but, over that cost of having multiplayer. Would it be safe for me to say that this isn't the kind of game that you consider to be done boxed product this is something you'll you're hopefully going to continue adding to expanding to throughout throughout the mystical future and it's a funny it's funny you say that it's it's because you know since we've launched in early access uh you know we've really raised the bar on the quality of the game uh and you know we've been working on it constantly i'd say every eight weeks we release a patch so it, it funnily enough not even having released our game's launch state, we're kind of already in what appears to look like a live model where we're releasing a major patch every eight weeks. It changes the nature of the game. Hmm. People come back and re-engage with the community, re-engage with the game, re-engage with the community. You can see the chat actually in our B-roll here. We actually have a live chat, even though it's single player. Uh, and yeah, so we're, we're kind of already there. And in, in a lot of people kind of speak like that and that's kind of our plans with epoch you know we have a vision to keep this game going we want to we want to epoch in five years ten years you know it's uh, and and we're already kind of in that model where we're constantly changing and updating hear. the content as we add new content at the same time so it's 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 funny we we've rolled into that format that you're that you're mentioning i mean i try and always um describe um live live service or live development not as a way in which one squeezes money from a user but the manner in which like developing a title which evolves with its user base where the goal is to continually add and create in support of your community 
Um, though sadly, it does often get bounded around when involving uh, more, we'll say, aggressive monetization strategies. Um, so I th we've seen all of those ourselves. Like, I mean, we, as as a player of all of these, we've seen how those things kind of work. And yeah, and you're totally right. A live service is is more about the opportunity to continue to make a game that people want to play. Right? Yeah. It's a chance to you know I I don't want to keep, uh, you know being a broken record about it, but you know, it gives us a chance to listen to our community, change content, add content that's requested, pull content that you know people don't like, and you know, it gives us a chance as action RPG players to put things in that we've always wanted. Uh, and a really big thing, if anyone knows about this genre, is lots of loot drops. There's tons of it. Uh, this is just kind of an example of something we're releasing. Is uh, you know, we're creating a loot filter inside the game that will be baked completely into the game. You'll be able to access it at any time. So you know. Whereas other games, you have to kind of go and get external tools to do these type of things. Things that we see happen like that in other action RPGs, we love to kind of bring Sorry. into the game. So. When you say loot filter, you mean um, sites or uh, external resources that allow you to research what weapons you could get, where they come from, what they do, right? More specifically, actually, it's the way, so you'll see as loot drops, it's a way to show you only the kind of loot that you want. And this is a really popular feature that is in oh. uh, other games like Path of Exile. Yeah, so people use those filters constantly Lovely. to kind of make it easier to see, and we're putting it right in the game so you don't have to download it. And just, just that's a long-winded way to answer your question is, yeah, like live service you know this is that's a great opportunity for us to kind of hear those things and that's what it's about it's not you know it's not about figuring out ways to add monetization we actually don't have any um monetization currently uh but we have some plan for launch we're looking at you know vis visual micro you know mtx uh, oh. you know some cool armor i think things like that but we never want to affect gameplay it's Indeed. so important for us to never touch gameplay it's i mean giving your user base ways in which they can help your game continue and succeed is always wonderful um, without it being aggressive and that focus on all right well we're gonna do this hang on uh, we're gonna do this around again because i'm because ah. i'm allowed to <laughs> um but it's lovely to see that kind of mod level functionality because we do see it with a lot of titles where the assumption of user accessibility is kind of Put on the user to find these mods or create them if they don't exist so uh, not to, to toot your horns um but the idea of looking at the user experience even at this stage is something that you know makes my little gaming heart happy and usually it's the kind of thing you have to fight production for not hear production tell you is a great thing you know what i mean yeah, no, for sure. And I mean, I mean, it's it's great because I started here as a game designer. I I was one of the guys making some of these spells and some of the gameplay movements happening. So you know, be, being able to kind of do that and now help the whole production. You know, it's not just me though. You know, our, Judd, our game director, that's really important to his vision on the project. All of our lead designers, our art team, even you know, it's some of us. I gotta tell, be honest with you. You know, I'm 32. My wrist isn't as uh you know fast <laughs> as it used to be. Uh, you know, and that that kind of plays into what we feel about the game too uh so you know you'll you'll notice how slow or how deliberate the motion is in the game compared to path of mm. exile or diablo where things could be a lot more quick and and yeah. you know we, we like to see those things go up and through production the ways we believe in the user experience kind of come from us as players too some of us are a bit older and do enjoy traditional styles okay. of games and we actually we like to mix the things there's one thing that leads very neatly into a, a question that uh, Beadora is restating. Because I've got to say, um, Sano and the rest of your team have been answering questions faster than I can even read them. Like, they have been on it. Um, but Beadora added an interesting question that a lot of the communication to the user is done through lighting effects and visuals. Are there going to be any settings for uh, colorblind modes and things like that? Definitely. We actually just had a meeting last week about this. Um, we were actually specifically talking about color blindness uh, and the ways that we could support it. Uh, we, uh, you know, for us, obviously, a challenge is balancing adding those kind of features while also developing active features. We are a small team, uh, and uh, but uh, but to, oh, to be sorry. very clear, just very to, important for us. Just to add, so it doesn't get skipped over. Uh, one of the things that uh, Daniel means by that is it's very hard to implement these things whilst the game is still in development. It's much easier to start working on these things when the game is done. So to, to undertake it at this stage is no small feat. I felt that was worth stating. 
Totally. And, and, and the final point is it's very important to us. We, we were just talking about how it would look in our game. Uh, and those kind of user accessibility features are things that we are definitely targeting uh, and they're very important to us. Okay. So, Daniel, thank you so much for coming to join me. Is there anything you'd like to add um, for, our, for our last wee minute before we move on to our next title? Not really. This has all been fantastic. I really love the way you guys have been hosting this all. All of these games look great. And I mean, thanks to everyone for kind of taking the time and checking out Last Epoch. I mean, thank you for bringing it in. And I do want to say another shout out to your lovely community members who have been in chat being just, just feckin' lovely. I said lovely twice. You know what? And I meant it. <laughs> 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 awesome uh thank you so much again no thank you again and friends uh, last bpoc is up on steam at the moment in early access if this is something that intrigues you and you'd like to check it out go over and have a look okie dokie so cheers guys and let's head over over here right and once again last epoc team thank you so i have a game coming up for you it's called under and when I played the early build of this, it did me a spoop. So if you'll forgive me for being um, uh, brutally honest for a second, I'm going to go use the bathroom. So I will be back in, in but two minutes because I am not playing that game with a full bladder. I am not going to be that guy. All right. So last Epoch team, thank you again. We're going to pop onto the BRB screen for BRB screen for just a second. I'll leave you with some of the smooth Game Chops jams. Um, and then I'm going to be getting spooked. Oh, good. Okie dokie lokies. So, ladies, gentlemen, and individuals of all persuasions, our next game is simply called Under. Uh, it is a World War One themed horror game. Very, very evocative of layers of fear, amnesia, with more than a snifter of that PT goodness. I just threw my pen on the floor like an Egypt. Um... I can understand if any of you would like to tap out at this stage. Um, from my understanding, there's no direct content warnings. But I'm not joking. Playing the early build of this did me a spoop sideways. So if you are, if you are down to Spooky Clown, come join me on a very, 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 very haunted looking liner. The thing is, I wasn't even playing it with headphones last time. I was just... Testing it out, making sure it works. Um, actually, heck, I have not been a good host to you lovely individuals. The other thing that I should say is that all of the titles that you have seen or will see today are at varying stages in development. These are not finished and could be subject to change, at least in a lot of stability. Uh, so anything, anything weird or odd that you might encounter, um, I'm just, you know what? I'm just stalling at this point, aren't I? I'm just stalling. Oh, good. Oh, good. So, bear with just a second as we get this build all lulled in. Excuse me. I shouldn't have hoofed that water. <laughs> I was like, Will, stalling? What? And you... Hang on. Uh, bear with us all just a second. Let me make sure this is up and running. 
once more with feeling. There we go. There we go. Oh. Uh, okay, uh, please bear with me. I'm having some teeny tiny technical problems right about now. Um, so let's get this up and going again. Come on. Would you believe me if I said that I uh, had this up and running happily? <laughs> This is the epitome of, we'll do it live! <laughs> oh. Why? Why must you do this to me now? Um, uh, if anyone wants to just uh, make a series of, uh, of spooky ghost noises uh, in chat, that would be lovely. Help set the scene. Let's bring the tone together. Um, because from... Empowered Diablo 2-esque fantasy to no power. Oh, why are you doing me like this? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, Beatora. Be Beatora. Thank you, Beadora. Uh, Wraith, uh, uh, Altair, getting those spooky noises going. I'm very, very grateful. Well, isn't this exciting? Um, thank all of you for throwing in some spooky noises. <laughs> and apparently there has been some spooky ghost train attempts as well. Lovely, lovely. Oh, aha! All right. It took a while. But we got here. Okay. Let's see if this works. <laughs> Yeah, see, all I needed was for everyone to make spooky noises to make it work. Adjust the slider until the icon is barely visible. Must resist the urge to turn it up to max. Oh, this is absolutely a banger. A club banger right here. So, friends, I do apologise for the uh, the technical issues there. I just needed to leave it to uh, to get itself sorted instead of pushing buttons in a panicked manner. Which is funny because this game is going to have me pushing buttons in a panicked manner. I don't suppose we can just take the stairs to the engine and be done with this? No. <sighs> so, as I was saying, friends, uh, under is uh, under is a post World War One horror game, very, very evocative of games like Layer of Fear, Amnesia, non-combative like New School Horror. It is going to do me a damage. Oh. I tell you what, how about if instead of looking for the ghost, we just spend half an hour looking at uh, British munitions trans... No, fine. Oh, notice, do not run into door. <laughs> the idea that this has happened so much as to require it. Oi. Oi. All right, I'm gonna get a run up, sorry. Uh, it is also worth saying that this is very much a psychological horror. 
where this takes place isn't made entirely clear during the demo. Is this transpiring in our player's mind, uh, in our character's mind as the effects of PTSD? Are they literally alone aboard a transport vessel while the, the very war they have escaped from, like, tries to escape them? Wow. The war they escaped from tries to escape them. God, lordy, lordy. Anyway, let's read this. <clears throat> Dear Amelia, Today was our first day on the front since we arrived for training. I'm quite impressed by the... Blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> oh, you can tell the fears getting to me already. Uh, blah, 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 blah. I'm quite impressed by the conditions. Not as bad as I expected. Hmm. I must insist. Uh, we'll have to visit France once this war is over. Anyway, after a day of mostly getting our trenches combat ready, I gathered my platoon members and I have to say, I'm getting quite... We're getting along quite well with these chaps. Uh, we have a shared spirit for adventure. Although, there is one man in particular who quite concerns me. I believe his name is Alexander. He visualizes a man who has no ambition for this war. Worst of all, already seems frightened. Thoroughly. <coughs> wow, I was being too British there. <coughs> oh, turns out you can be too British. <coughs> uh, seems frightened throughout the entire of the day. I'm hoping that he will man up. Our officer clearly told us that every man needs to work together for our platoon to be combat effective. I'll write you soon. Much love, Thompson. Oh, feck. You know when you know something's coming? We have to listen to this gramophone to continue, and I don't want to. This need not be a solitary topic for you. For your departure, there is a need for you to dispense with me. Now tell me. I heard them speak of him. He was there. There was always general word of his existence. Put on this arm to chase the those who fence for themselves only. Never had I seen them. Now when did you hear of him? And what was the name he went by? What God? They spoke to him after a murder was committed. After <sighs> countless lives were lost to the actions of one. Can I just... They can I just... I can just... Man's just... Land, slowly peering <sighs> into every man's life or blood. Those who still live, live no more after he had died. Searching he was, they said. But the one who sided with his very own country, Lucifer himself. Therefore, listen, you can hear the plumbing hoops. I right, catfish water. Thank you so kindly for the compliment. Kids. I'm Trust doing my best to mask my legit fear. Therefore, to speak of evil this way. One doesn't know the terrors of sudden death until you see it. Darkness arises <sighs> long before men are buried in their graves. Those cloven people find those a guilt. Okay, take it. Sweep it. This will not construct our world. Make sure it's gone. Oh, good. I don't like this. Clap, 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 clap. Sorry, I should also point forward that when I say I don't like this, I do mean the horrific experience of being trapped on a sea vessel where cloven hooves is the thing one must worry for, not the experience. So please do not take any of my potential cussings as a detriment to the title. <sighs> no one's home! No. Ah, uh, I know what's coming! Oh, well, what was this? Uh, Alright, so this is... Dare not turn around British marmalade. Oh, I can feckin' hear him. Oh, still hate it! Come be the host of the IGA Indie Showcase, Renee said. It'll be fun! Uh. 
I cast my eyes once towards chat and everyone's like, it told you not to turn around. Okay, so I can remember to stand up again. Oh, I freaking hate this. All right. Dinner for you, sir. Two empty bowls of feckle. And a life vest. Uh... Oh, feck. I don't suppose the uh, lock is magically open in this bit? No. Goody. Goody. Uh, again, friends, if you do encounter any uh, weirdness in terms of gameplay-wise, uh, this is a very, very early build, which the developers very kindly rushed us last night. Um... I did manage to accidentally get myself stuck in the crouching position because I'm an idiot. Which turned this into like a very, very, very aggressive version of that. Um, oh, what's the one where you play as a toddler? That one. Oh, I don't like this. Clap, 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 clap. Oh, I don't like this. <sighs> I know enough to know I need to be afraid. Tip! Crouch under tables to hide from danger. Mayor's safety matches. Contains fire. Only fire I spit is my rhymes. Oh, good. Oh, good. I tell you what, what if for the rest of the IGA showcase, I just stay here in the galley, I'll cook you up a nice meal, be like, cook, sir... Alright, it was worth a shot. Uh, also, uh, if I do start singing terribly, I, I have a thing where I sing- OH FUCK! I am so sorry for my swears there. I, I strive to be a consummate professional, I do apologize. <laughs> yeah, I would like to extend a, a formal apology for my cussing there. I did not mean to do that. Safety torch, put it on your porch, it's a safety porch. Put it in the hallway. <sighs> Boy, sure do love demonic haunted World War One soldiers just busting on it on my day. Is rising. No. Nope. Oh, I do not like this. Beck, where's the key? Not saying I didn't get this far, but I didn't get this far. remember where the key was. I'm very glad that you lot can't spook me with like scary alerts or anything right now. I am spooked enough as this is. Oh, don't make me go down there. Oh, no, okay. I don't have to go down there. That's cool. Maybe back the way I came? Feck. Cool. There's a lot of my fears being combined all into one here. Make a game, they said. Call it that. Oh, there we go. Alright, I got the keys. It was by Spooky Man David's Closet. Sorry to anyone out there who is actually named David. Alright. Now, there's a well known fact that ghosts can't swim, so we'll be fine. Oh. Oh, feckin' hell. 
out. No, come on! What? No, no, this is not okay. <sighs> Just gonna play for 10 more minutes. Just gonna. Oh, cool, the kids don't have faces! Unless you've ever stayed in a butlins, in which case you have been scared by a bed at least once. Anyone else here? Feckin' wet. And so I apologise, I'm not doing the best job of describing this this scenario. By now you've probably seen the, the elements which reminded me of, of layers of fear and things like that. Like, the, the geometry of this world that is simultaneously... Oh, facial reconstruction, class four. Uh, the procedure deemed unsuccessful after... Left... Uh, okay, after it left the patient with animalistic tendencies. Oh, goody. Uh, I'm not doing a great job of describing this title. Because... Like, especially playing this on headphones, the the audio design, even at this stage, is exceptional. No, I don't want to go down there! This door can be unlocked with a key. No. No. Okay, so I tell you what, for the rest of this, we're going to stay in here. For the second life act, a chance to serve again. Oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> Catfish says, forgive me, but do you hire out for parties? I mean, not in 2020, but certainly. I am I am merely the, the host selected by the IGDA uh, this afternoon. <gasps> Wait, the statue heads follow. No! That was creepy ass. Yeah, no, they definitely were looking at me as I left. As I was saying earlier, it's it's unclear as to where this game takes place. Is this in the mind of someone who has survived the horrors of you know, one of the most horrific conflicts in human history? Is this genuinely a spooky haunted boat full of spooky haunted bad times? What creatures do we face... And can we even face them? Don't like this. No! I really don't like this. I keep nervously scritching my nose. Oh! It seems weird that I would spend the entirety of this demo whinging and saying no, and yet would inspire all of you to, uh, to either observe... Uh, I'll keep a, a sharp hawk's eye on this title. Ah, oh, he's gonna feckin' do me. I know it! Face me, you spooky bastard! The tension's killing me. Ah... Uh. On. I don't like this. Clap, 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 clap. Friends, I'd love to tell you that I am playing up for the cameras. I'd love to tell you that. No. No, I do not want to pick those keys up. No, I do not want to. Oh, my word. I'd love to tell you I'm playing this up. But. The, the sound of the water creeping in, the, the creaking of the ship, even the buzzing of the lights. 
I don't know if it's coming across via the stream, but the tension of it is doing me a damage! <sighs> it is doing me a damage. He's gonna come on out. I know it. He's gonna be all like, doom ba doom. I'm gonna. This is why I had to take a bathroom break before we did this. Why can't we just. Sorry, friends. I should say, I genuinely love horror games and games that deal with psychological elements. And I find that horror as a genre has a lot of power to. to look at the parts of the human condition which we don't like talking about like PTSD trauma I feel that games have a way to make us empathize with those experiences as weird as that is to say well I'm getting the spook the spooked out of me sideways oh and the water levels rising and I do not like this but the thing is well, I'm not saying that everyone should play horror games all of the time. I am saying that I appreciate how titles like this handle very difficult topics. Oh, you feckin' bad words. Crawl through the vent to my doom. Oh, seems to be the deck outside. So this very much has that impossible geometry thing going on. Like if we tried to follow a map of this, it wouldn't. E it wouldn't e make sense. A goblin sense interactive saying, "You can do it, Will." No, I can't. I am stalling by trying to make arty points about this video game. I'm being a terrible host because I'm afraid. There, I said it. Are you happy now? No, no! And see, usually I can take a break. Usually I can take a breather, but I don't have time because there is very limited slots today, so I have to keep going. I don't have time to find my courage. And it's too early in the day to drink. Oh, you... Please do not take my reactions to this game as... Oh! to apologize again for my intermittent cussing. That made me jump. That made me jump. Whew. Oh, the power's but... Like this, clap, 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 clap. <laughs> uh, to Kawai, uh, Kawai saying that the reaction seems like a hearty endorsement. Oh no, absolutely. Keys to a room. Just how this game is gently filling up with water. You, you big lanky bad word. I know you're out here. Electrical supplies. A breaker box fuse. Some bulbs. <gasps> A 
chair and is like, you worried the Black Donald's gonna get you, friend? Nay, hey, I'm worried Black Donald's gonna take me soul. I've seen the face of horror. I've seen the darkness which stalks the feckin' boat that does me damage. I also, when I initially played this demo, I was curious as to uh, why they chose to make the character so tall. Like, playing as a tall character would feel like a very empowering element. No, it's so that you've got a lot longer to feel like you're getting trapped underwater. I'm doing something. Where are you going? You've got the fuse. I don't know! I don't know boats! Do I look like I know boats? Sweet mercy in a bin bag. Screw you, Black Donald! Oh, lovely. Just in time for elevensies. Oh, would you look at that on the dot? So, ladies, gentlemen, and individuals of all persuasions, that was under. Short demo. Um. I am so glad our next game is nothing like this. That's gonna haunt me in my dreams. <laughs> but no, um, ladies, and gentlemen, and all persuasions, please again do not take my my cussing or my uh, incoherent screaming as anything other than a compliment. Uh, to Gobliss Interactive, now thank you. I know you and the team rushed really hard to get us that build last night. And while that is a super duper early build of the game, it is really good even at this stage. Um, I mean, I'm going to need a bloody pint and a lie down after this, but... <laughs> but that is neither here nor there. Um, uh, to Gobliss Interactive, I apologise... Uh, if you have any uh, links or elements or places people can go to continue finding out about this title, please drop them in chat now. Uh, jumping back, Catfish was saying perhaps they could add an auto map feature. The thing I will say is that the identical corridor elements of it had me exploring, and that plus the slow tension of the rising water did work very well. I don't know if that came across, and I really hope it did. Okay. Um, but again... To under, thank you so much for preparing that build. Now, uh, next up, we have Externus, Path of Solari. And I believe that this time I actually do have a, uh, a trailer ready for you lovely Mother Hubbards. Uh, assuming I've done my bloody job right. That's a big assumption as well. That's a huge assumption. Uh, and then we're going to be joined by um, uh, Trevor who is going to be chatting to us about the game. But I do think I should show you the trailer because Corgi Knight. Like I... Externus has a lot of very complicated systems and a gorgeous art style. It looks fresh as heck. But I need to show you Corgi Knight because until I've shown you, we... honestly, we can't talk about this. Okay. Here we go. Let me bring this down so I don't accidentally blow everybody's ears out. And away... We go. No. Oh. The winds of change are blowing through the world. A shadow grows amongst hushed rumors of an unknown threat. The Endbringer. The God Killer. The Abomination. Absurd stories told to frighten children into obedience. With the gods absent, war erupts across the land. People's hope turns to the Soldat Solari. An ancient order dedicated to preserving balance. The 
sold out to ready themselves for what lies ahead. Okie dokie. Can you understand now why I desperately, desperately needed to show you all that trailer? Right. Let's bring Trevor on to chat about Externus. Uh, well, I'm sure I will find out that I have been pronoun pronouncing it entirely incorrectly. Okay. Trevor, hello, hello. How's it going? It's going very good. Sorry, bear with me just a second. Uh, yep. I was... You can tell it's a very professional operation on my part today. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, <laughs> the winds of change are blowing through the world. A shadow grows amongst hushed rumors of an unknown threat. I, hey, the I'm Endbringer, <laughs> the God Killer, That's why we have the Abomination. Absurd stories told to frighten children into obedience. With the gods absent, war erupts across the land. The dog knife. The people's out. hope turns to the soldat Solari. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm Trevor Oz. I'm the community manager for uh, the game. An ancient Solari. order it's dedicated to preserving uh, balance. Turn-based tactical RPG uh, that we that is character driven. Uh, we're gonna have uh, over. Uh, I I want to. I don't know what the final count is, but it's definitely over uh, about ten to fifteen new characters uh, uh, that be able to. Put in your party, uh, dear, uh, dear Trevor. I must apologise. Um, that was uh, that was one technical feck up after another. There, um, I had your B-roll going at full blast volume. So unfortunately, these lovely mother hubbards didn't get to, to <laughs> hear your introduction. I'm so sorry. That's okay. We did get to cover uh, the Corgo Night twice, so I feel sl yes. somewhat justified. <laughs> um, uh, Trevor, I'm so sorry. But yeah, uh, once again, uh, I'm Trevor Ross. Uh, I'm the community manager for Winterborn. Uh, our game, Externus Path of the Solari, it's a uh, turn-based tactical RPG, uh, much in the vein of uh, classics such as Final Fantasy Tactics, uh, Shining Force, uh, games like that. Um, Sorry, uh, I'd, that, that at least... I'd forgotten about Shining Force until you brought it back up there. Feckin yeah, actually, our uh, our studio head, and uh, he's the lead programmer and everything, um, Kent, uh, Shining Force is probably one of his favorite games of all time, so... That's definitely the DNA that's that's kind of uh, in our game, uh, and it's what we're striving for to make just a good game that we want to play. Um, but we have a, a ton of characters. Uh, it's very character driven. Uh, our big thing is: uh, is it fate that gets you into the situation, or is it a choice? Uh, so we definitely have some choices uh, within uh, Externus. Um, that was the thing that struck me from from watching the trailer and the b-roll is a very very heavy focus on like choice based evolving narrative 
and mm -hmm. it's one of those things which i'm always always so happy to see especially in tactical turn-based games and you know i if it seems like i've played a lot of games i've played a lot of games i gave up <laughs> sleep at a very young age um but i found with shining force and with a lot of the fire emblems there does tend to be this the fate of the world rests on mm -hmm. your shoulders hero so now play this battle eight times so you can clear it without losing anybody and continue <laughs> And yeah, I find and that especially the way in which you have this storybook narrative evolving between combat seems really fresh. Yeah, we we actually want the story to almost feel like you're grabbing a book off the shelf, but a book that you can uh, choose your own adventure. Uh, our game is actually based on a uh, tabletop game that Kent created uh, in his in his parents' basement uh, when he was a teenager that we played uh, during our high school and, and early college years. Um, so we want that feeling of being, being at the table and being able to make those choices. And whenever you have a character and a character death, we, we actually want that to mean something. We don't want people to, to save scum as they say, um, well, and, I always, and try to, well, I always found that the, uh, I'm going to bully fire emblem for a bit, but they've sold a gajillion copies so they, they can take mm -hmm. it. That Fire Emblem always tried to put towards you this idea that, you know, you would lose characters, rotate characters. But what it ended up being mm. is that one would play the same level multiple times so that you don't lose anyone. So rather than allowing that permadeath to enrich the experience, the permadeath just adds basically like a, an additional lose condition. Yeah, it, it just adds more of a difficulty. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what we're trying to not do. We want our death to actually be meaningful. So uh, a character death could actually have both positive and negative aspects that, that'll uh, be seen on, that'll take place on other characters. So their death their death will actually mean something. Okay. Um, it'll actually change the narrative. Okay. So the other thing so. that I desperately wanted to talk to you about, aside from the Corgi Knight, which we will get to, um, the art style in this is very fresh. Uh, the environments have this, um, oh, this diorama feel to them. And the characters have this incredibly cream, uh, incredibly clear. Can I get a do-over on that one? Do you mind if I get another run-up uh, on that phrase? Yeah, go for it. Okay, yeah. an incredibly clean, crisp style about them. Yes, third time's a charm. Um, yeah, I would actually. You, how did you hit upon this art style, Yo? So that's actually all due to our artist Moody Hamo. Um, it's his own unique art style, uh, Moody. Uh, Moody's fantastic. Uh, he basically, we basically, when we were trying to decide for an art style, we wanted something that wasn't, uh, a lot of the games are very anime, which we, we, we like anime and we like that art style, but we didn't want it to be that. Um, and then, you know, you have a traditional fantasy. So we kind of almost wanted to meet something in the middle. And actually, oddly enough, when we were looking at our artist's Instagram page, uh, we just fixated on one of his drawings that had a character, uh, that we based our whole character style on. Um, and that's what we went with. That's lovely. Um, so we've covered, I guess, the the intent of this title. We've covered uh, the style. So how would you sum up this, this arcing story that you've put forward? Because... I, I feel that gives a lot of grounding and weight to these characters, and at least from mm -hmm. what little I've seen of it. Sadly, I haven't had the chance to, to get stuck into it. Uh, but as I said with previous uh, interview guests, I will be abusing my power to get an early copy. I am absolutely <laughs> shameless because I want to play this. Um, can you give us at least a, a little overview on the world in which this takes place? So yeah, the, the world of Externus is uh, pretty massive. It takes place over two continents. Um, with several countries. And for us, we want each country to be unique. So actually a little bit at the end of our B-roll video, uh, before it loops over, you'll see our newest level, which takes place in the country of Flame, uh, which is more of a, a desert country, um, which is actually inspired by uh, our artist Moody. He's originally from Sudan. Uh, so a lot of his artwork uh, within Flame is actually inspired by, by Sudan. So... Uh, he gets to actually put that into the game. That would explain the the freshness of it. This doesn't feel like it's evocative of the like um, the pseudo medieval style that we see very frequently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we definitely want to. We want each country and each area to feel unique. 
um, and different. Um, so that way it actually feels like you are going into another country uh, whenever you're traveling throughout the game. Yes, and this isn't to, to diss again on the Shining Force and the Fire Emblem. It's, it's very hard to create different nations when your best mate's a centaur. Um, there's <laughs> <laughs> One needs more subtlety sometimes. Um can we talk about can we talk about the corgi knight i feel this needs we can to be... we I... can talk about the corgi knight we can talk about sir pendleton <laughs> can we um, please the... talk about sir pendleton and i know again i'm abusing my power to talk about the bits that i want to so um... so yeah a, a big a big thing was uh so kent and his wife have two corgis um that they love dearly and honestly this was really just a way for him to get his dog into the game <laughs> done so I mean, what, uh, what is game development if not an excuse to show off your, your lovely pets to the world? Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, we came up with the idea for Sir Pendleton. Um, he starts off as a regular corgi um, and somehow uh, becomes anthropomorphic, which uh, we'll leave uh, to those that want to play the story indeed, uh, to indeed. find out uh, his, his background on that. But um, I know, but I know the, I've been, sorry, please. I was going to say the cool thing about him is that uh, really in battle he can only use a spear or long arm because his arms are so short. Because he's a corky. Yeah. I mean, he's bipedal. And this was one of the things that actually shined through. And I know it seems kind of very mimetic of me to focus on Dog Knight, but it's the care that goes into it which I feel shines through even at this early stage. Like, yes, he is a dag that's been turned into a, into a hero warrior. But he's still only about yay tall, so he has to use a pole arm mm. to be an effective fighting unit because he can't jump slash. I, mean, I guess he could run at people's ankles, but that's a <laughs> that would be demeaning for a knight of his stature. Exactly, and he is very well aware if he is being demeaned, and he is very angry about being short. Indeed, well, one of the individuals <laughs> pointed out um, earlier that you know he's described as gruff and foul-tempered. But if everyone was constantly going, oh, look at you little cheeky cheeks, and you're an actual knight of the realm, one might get a little grumpy. Exactly. That's ex that's exactly what we're going for with Sir Pendleton. So what are some of the other um, elements you're really looking forward to, to showing off? Because, again, I I feel I've overfixated a little here. So uh, one of the big things is we wanted, just like Final Fantasy Tactics, uh, we wanted to have the battlefield because there's a lot of tactics games now that have, you know, just the 2D plane without being able to control the camera. Mm. Um, but we think controlling the camera and having the whole 3D realm adds something to the combat, adds a little bit more uh, tactical flair, what have you, to the combat. So that's why we're working on having a, a full 3D environment to go with our 2D character. Mm. And it, uh, it works so. very, very well. Um, now, obviously, you've mentioned Final Fantasy Tactics a couple of times. Uh, can you confirm or deny the existence of a snowball fight in this game? Uh, I don't think we've discussed it, um, but our studio is named Winterborn, so it would certainly fit the theme. Like, I'm not saying that you have to, <laughs> but if it doesn't, I will have to report you to the elders of video games. Um, <laughs> hopefully that didn't restart the audio... There we go. Sorry, I'm just making sure I haven't uh, just okay. deafened our lovely audience. Now, Catfish was pointing out something that uh, I'd love to touch on, is that creating a multipath adventure is very, very rewarding, but challenging to create. Um, what are some of the challenges that have jumped up when trying to make a story with such a, an expansive arc? Well, the good thing about our arc is we do have our... We have the base storyline, so we know we know the big story beats so it's pretty much more uh the choices are more character driven okay so they're more based on your characters and how characters will react or how the characters will react to other characters so i mean you might have a, a point where a character doesn't like another character and wants to leave the party over it you know and, and stuff like that so uh there's a lot of different factors but it's very character driven it's it's very much meant to uh get you engaged with these characters as actual people indeed well one of the examples used in the the b-roll trailer was interacting with this particular green knight whose name escapes me right now um could you take us through because it seems like choosing one path brings him to your party and the other gets him very killed could you take us through at least that little that little crossroads 
So for that, we showed it in our pre-alpha demo. Uh, we're still in pre-alpha. You can uh, actually check out the demo uh, on our website at externusgame.com. Uh, if one of you lovely Mother Hubbards could drop the Externus Games uh, link in chat, that would be lovely. Sorry, please continue. Um, yeah, uh, so externusgames.com for that. And uh, But yeah, uh, the, the path for him, uh, it's actually really, <laughs> really interesting uh, because if you if you let... Uh, essentially, we put in a generic mercenary uh, mm. for this character in the demo, uh, which which they named him Trevor De Oz um, <laughs> after me. <laughs> um, De Oz, so, your your hero name. Yes. Um, so if if he dies, the actual final battle in the demo actually becomes easier uh, because without his clunky armor, you can actually sneak into that final battle. Oh. <laughs> um, and have a tactical advantage. Hopefully, that uh, whereas isn't... if he lives, oh, sorry, he don't. Hopefully, that isn't your team making a a commentary on your personal fighting style. <laughs> well, uh, we did play games for a long time together, so at least tabletop wise. So, <laughs> oh, and to Stainless Seal, thank you kindly for dropping the Externus game link in chat. So, friends, if you do want to check this, you said the demo was available on the website. Yeah, it's on website. It's it's through our itch page, but the the link is right there on the front of the website. Ah, lovely, lovely. Um, well, if it's on the itch page, that means I get to play it uh, after today's show. So uh, nobody yeah. DM me once we're done with the show. All right, because and I'm... and again, everybody, keep in mind it is pre alpha. We're still we're still very early. Um, we're hoping to. Uh, our goal is to launch next summer, but you know it's game development, so that could get pushed back a little bit. Indeed, indeed. Uh, actually, I should apologize because that was that was on me to say that like this game and all the games we've shown today are in varying stages of early development. So, uh, hey, yeah, I'm a, I'm a community manager and marketing guy. I'm used to this. CMs <laughs> represent. Uh, we've had a lot of community managers hanging out today. That makes me feel very good. Um, so you know what. Uh, the magical money bags question has been a fun one today, so I'm gonna I'm gonna dust it off and uh, and repurpose it for yourself. So, Mister Mister Magical Money Bags comes by with his infinite bag of money and drops it on your team and says, "Right, there you go. What is your making no promises? What is your you know money no question feature you'd love to add through to this?" I know a big thing that we were gonna do as a as a Kickstarter. Uh stretch goal if if we had gotten that far was was base building um it, it wouldn't have been anything but i mean i guess if we had infinite money we could definitely expand it to however we liked oh yeah uh, but i know in the tabletop game uh, our party had a house that we would build onto so i think that's definitely one aspect that we would like to that we would like to see in the game um if we had the money uh <laughs> that's you know because it, it would be it'd be something uh, a little bit extra mm. uh we think, but it isn't required to, to enjoy the story. Okay. So and actually, that's definitely something we'd work on. Speaking of the narrative, um, I saw the, um, the the campfire scene again at the crossroads element from the uh, from the early demo. Um, how much interaction between characters are we going to see? Uh, are we going full relationship? Is it going to be evocative of um, uh, fire emblems? If you fight next to someone for long enough, you have a child that's suddenly fully grown? I've never understood that. <laughs> Um, how do uh, characters interact in this, if you don't mind my asking? Uh, it, it's more you'll be at the campfire scene and have these campfire scenes uh, take place uh, usually uh, between most battles or activities uh, and stuff like that. So you, you'll see you'll see different interactions, different characters will interact with each other. Um, you'll be able to you know choose which characters speak to each other, that sort of thing, and uh, go from there lovely lovely um so dear friends if you have any questions for for trevor and for the the externus team uh, now's the time to throw them in just if you at uh, igda in the chat it makes it a little easier for me to spot um because asari was just asking offhand is this going to be on steam yes uh our plan right now is to put it out on steam uh will also be on the xbox one uh oh, and the switch so um uh, sorry to bring it back to uh, Will's dog-obsessed mimetic nonsense, but Alnus was asking, will we be able to pet the Corgi Knight? If he lets you. <laughs> so See, may maybe maybe he has to like you to let, to let you. Most places ask, 
can you pet the dog? This game asks, are you good enough to pet the dog? Exactly. Uh, and Alanis was also asking, <laughs> oh, is there any cow themes in this? Uh, well, based on uh, the earlier uh, <laughs> part of the stream that I was definitely watching, uh, there seems to be a lot of cows, so I'll definitely have to bring that to the team and make sure that we get at least one cow level in there. Okay. So. Uh, I'll have to also ask under the horror game if they'll add a cow in there, because apparently that's what we're doing. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, he did have the cloven hooves, right? So Yes. It's, it's, it's close. It's farmyard-esque. Um, yeah. Uh, and, oh, uh, Catfish, I apologize that I didn't notice your comment earlier, since they were asking on something if it was uh, Alice Suikoden. Uh, has Suicoden had much of an influence on this project? I, w I would say yes. Uh, at, at least it was in the back of our mind. Um, I don't. I don't know if uh, any of us have really played through the the Suikoden games though. So um, I I myself haven't played them. Uh, I'm sure Kent has though, because Kent, our uh, <laughs> our lead, has played pretty much every tactical game. It's so. it's not a worry. I'm sorry, asking any cats in game. Uh, to be determined. Oh, so watch so... this space. Um, so is there anything that I haven't asked you about that you'd like to to highlight? We've got we've got a good solid five minutes left. We can get we can get into the weeds. We can just do fluffy stuff. Oh, so def definitely one thing uh, that I did want to highlight was the the tactical gameplay and positioning and and how that actually is going to oh. matter. Um, in the game, um, definitely, you know, if you have the high ground, if you're at their back or to their flank, uh, you'll definitely do more damage, stuff like that. But uh, the environment will also matter too. So, you know, if you're if you're standing in a marsh or a wetland or something, and and someone uses lightning on you, you're gonna take more damage. You're gonna have a bad uh, time. I apologize. I just from seeing the B-roll, my brain was like, oh well, of course there's, you know, of course there's uh, height advantages and different terrains. Mm. Sorry, it's the the problem with assuming, you know. Yeah, yeah, and and that's why I definitely wanted to point that out, because um, and we haven't we haven't worked with too many environmental things yet. Uh, there's no environmental stuff in the actual demo, uh, but that's definitely planned uh, for the floor release. I mean, so. as you can see in this part of the B-roll, like this is very much um, like placeholder assets and things like that. So I guess it's all it is very much still coming together. Yeah, we're again we're still early, so uh, we're just now getting some systems down. We just. Uh, we just were able to get uh, some of our 3D assets moving, uh, as you as you can see towards the end of the B-roll, uh, with the wheel that spins in that level. Oh, and um, Theodora was just throwing another additional question. Will there be any uh, destructible terrain? You know, your barrels, your your chest high, explodable crates, etc. We're still figuring that out. Um, okay. We want we want to have stuff like that, uh, but it really just depends on how hard it is to implement. Uh, based on uh, the uh, 2D style in the 3D plane, um, that kind of does present some challenges, at least from from my very rudimentary understanding of the actual programming part of it. Um, as uh, as Kent would say, it can be a pain. <laughs> so I will say, uh, as a teeny tiny aside, I, one of the things I've loved about uh, today's whole showcase and with chatting with yourself is that we can talk real honestly about the creation, the process behind. Like, you can tell these lovely people it's honestly about how difficult it is to implement, and that's okay. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a lot harder than you'd think, because I, like, I, I don't know how to program. I'm just the guy that talks about the game. I, I don't know how hard it would be to implement that stuff, but I hear it all the time from from Kent and uh, Jack, our other programmer, how hard this stuff is, and, and yeah, I, I absolutely believe it. Uh, and just quickly, sorry, I was asking if there are any direct D&D uh, &D inspirations. Yes. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I, Speed question. I mean, it, it's it's based off of an original tabletop game, so it, it wasn't based on the D and D universe. But we did oh, create dude. our own universe. So, but there's obviously going to be you know D and D stuff that'll bleed into that. Of course, of course. Now I need to put my hand up and admit I have been a terrible host throughout your section because professional uh, Kent has just pointed out that you built your own engine. I should have asked yes. you when you came on. I just assumed you were using uh, Unity because of the movement. You build your own engine. Yeah, yeah, we're Great building our Laura. own engine. So, so here's the thing. Like uh, Kent, he 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 actually comes from uh, Infinity Ward. He worked on Call of Duty, 
uh, for is quite a, a few is that years. Is an indie game? Would I have heard of that? Yeah, it's a, a small game that <laughs> that you know might come out every year. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, but he, he one of the things he didn't get to do was build his own engine, and I, I think he wants to have he wanted that challenge of being able to create his own engine. So we're using the Monogame framework, uh, but yeah, he is building our own engine, which we call the the Broadsword engine uh, from scratch. That is an exceptional name. Um, now, as we've got uh, but a minute left, is there anything else you'd like to, to, to mention or highlight before we before we move on, dear friend? Um, honestly, just I love working with the team that we work on with, that I work with. Uh, you know, Moody is an exceptional artist. Uh, Kent does an amazing job at designing the game and doing the actual bulk of the programming. Jack is a great support programmer on, on the team. And uh, our uh, our sound uh, designer and engineer Boo, uh, Stephen, uh, he's very awesome at what he does, um, and I just love everything that they put out and that that they share to me. And like, I honestly can't cannot get enough of the stuff that I get to see that I haven't even been able to share out uh, to to everybody yet. But I can't wait to show as much of this game as possible once we're able to. Oh, that is lovely. Uh, Stainless Steel wants to say, and also say thank you to your biggest fans, which I believe is some of the lovely individuals lurking in chat. <laughs> uh, Beodora is saying, when you sell 5 million copies, we get a board game, right? Uh, well, I mean, uh, we would love to actually be able to make a tabletop, like do, do the tabletop <laughs> game like justice and actually make a version of the tabletop game available. And so professional that could be something... Professional Ken was just adding that they'd love to do a board game if they had a budget of more than ten dollars and stealing Wi-Fi from their neighbors. The trick, this, this is true. The trick is get a Pringles tin and put the Wi-Fi thin in there and point it at your neighbors. I mean, don't steal Wi-Fi. That's a bad maneuver. <laughs> um, so, Trevor, thank you so much for for coming on the show and showing off this glorious game. I thank you for putting up with my corgi enthusiasm, and I do apologize <laughs> for the technical issues. No, thank you guys so much for having us. We really appreciate it. Uh, and while I'm setting up the next game, please feel free to to spam links to Externus. Um... Oh, very quickly, uh, do you have an estimated launch window? Uh, estimated is summer of 2021. Glorious. Um, but uh, you know, it's it's game dev, so that might be a little bit later. But we're we're hoping for summer. Yeah. All right, uh, Trevor. Again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, and to uh, Schlater, uh, I honestly, I can't wait to play that. Um, finding out that there's a demo on Itch that I can go play. I'm not joking. I'm playing this after. All right. Now, as we leap from one game to t'other, uh, we are heading on to Potions next. Actually, I should stop. I should call it by its full title, which is Potions. A Curious Tale. Now, this has been one that I've been very much looking forward to showing to you all. Well, okay, you know what? They're all games I've been looking forward to showing to you. Um, this one is a concept that I have fallen in love with a lot. This is a fantasy game with heroes and spells and krakens and swords aplenty. But you are not playing as a person wielding a sword with grey hair and a horse that has a penchant for climbing on rooftops. You are playing as a apprentice potion crafter. You are not a swashbuckler or a murderer. You make magical potions. So how does a how does a fantasy world look when you as the character are but a uh, a crafter of a crafter of varying spells? Uh, you, can you tell I'm uh, <laughs> smashing buttons in the background to get the game up? Um, Potions of Curious Tale very much puts you in a familiar setting on a very, very, very different footing. And as I've said with all of today's games, they're all more than initially seemed. And this is absolutely no exception. So we're just going to jump straight into game. Again, friends, do let me know if the audio spikes or is weird or what have you. Uh, I do want to apologise for the trailer leaping in on that last one and deafening the lot of us. Oh, the conclave says, Potion seller, I am need of your strongest potion. Well. Uh, Beardora says, I'm a tad low. God, when did that happen? 
It's very rare that anyone ever says I'm too quiet. All right. So let's get into game. So don't do this to me, Unity. I, I need you. Okay. Hoppacha! Are we good? Did you see a gigantic kitty? You did see a gigantic kitty. Lovely. Right. Ladies, gentlemen, and individuals of all persuasions, welcome to Potions. A curious tale. And Sadlin has a wonderful random fact for you all that Potions, A Curious Tale, was the first non-sponsored video game to be officially shown at Geek Girl Con. We're all learning today. Now, I've got a lot of potions to craft and we have a lot of mischief to get into, so I'm going to leap right into game. It just struck me that once again we're on a boat with problems. Luna, our titular character, just adds an ow. Deckhand's like, you know it down there? Uh, I think so. My head broke my fall. And that a... <laughs> that a treat. I think we've run aground. Take these potions of healing and stable all deck. Top side in no place for a young girl. I apologise if that was a mic loud. I might need to... I might need to balance. Um, that's a very loud ground. Okie dokie. So press one and right click to down a potion. No, Beodora did not crash the game or the ship. It's meant to happen. Uh, and I don't know why the deck hand was from Yorkshire, I just decided that. Now I'm going to tell you what's about to happen very quickly because just in case the uh, monster sounds come through a wee bit loud, uh, we're about to face a Kraken because Krakens are jerks like that. Now. We are playing as a character with no fighting abilities and a handful of healing potions. How in the bleeding Nora does one defeat a Kraken with no weapons? Let me show you. I also, I worked out this whole boss battle by myself, which made me feel very smug. Get back, devilfish! I shall have your tentacles hung from the main yard like a slimy! Excuse me? What on earth is that thing? Oh, it's a Kraken. You should have stayed below deck, girl. Aha. Uh -huh. Chase me. Chase me. All right. I see you with your tendrils. Aha. Uh -huh. What's that? Tried to smack me with a tentacle and got a handful of spiky weapons that were left lying around. Aha. Uh -huh. Let's try that again. What's a Kraken to do when one slams one's tentacle into a bunch of spears? Oh god, they'd be like little shards of metal. However, we now find ourselves out of weapons. With naught but our wits about us. So how are we going to beat this big bad word? How about fire? We healed. So after slamming the tendril down on a spot of oil, I am this calamari good and proper. Yeah, boo bloody who, go back to your crackhead mother. Sinbad's like, ha ha! You're a marvel, my dear. The beast flees from you as the cat, as from the Calps Armada. I assume Calps a friend of his. A young girl sends a terrible monster to the depths. The bard shall sing of your great victory. Oh, hard to call it a victory. Nonsense! We are not dead, the ship is not sunk, the sun is above, the sea is below. What more could you ask for? But this is no time to celebrate. Full sail crew! Or what's left of our sail? Onward! To our destination! Sorry, I'm having a lot of fun with voices in this. Ah, oh, there we go. Praise be to Most High, we've arrived at last in the town of Old Haven. I know it doesn't look like much, but it's the only port this side of the wall. Ah, blah, 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 blah. Sorry. 
Wildlands, or the seawater. This side of the Wildlands attracts all manner of adventurers, treasure hunters, smugglers, and scoundrels. I wouldn't exactly call it safe passage, but a deal's a deal. Here's the rest of your payment, Captain Sinbad. Ah! But of course, the aloe vera auras arrive safe and sound. That is, well, she's the first one, actually. What? You mean all your other boats have sank? Well, yes. Why do you think we charge so little? It's like Megabus, which is a joke that won't work outside of the UK. Okay, friends. Welcome to the town of Wild Haven. Ah, Emily. Rival. Emily's like, excuse me. What happened to the ship? I was attacked. Sea monster just before we arrived. Not again. That Kraken has been attacking far more ships than it did in the past. What brings you here anyway? Old Haven isn't a safe town. Well, I'm here to study with my grandmother. I understand none of these voices fit these characters. I'm giving it my best. Study? Yep. Grandmother is this town's potion master. I'm here to learn the trade. You? Learn the intricacies of one of the more complicated forms of magic? I doubt you've been able to, be able to grasp the basic concepts. Well, uh, you're going to get in her way just when Old Haven needs her services dearly. Go back home and be coddled and let, more, uh, let a more worthy person be her apprentice. Okay. So we're going to go talk to Grandmother. Um, uh, I apologise if the levels are a little loud. I'll just, I'll just be louder to compensate. I don't want to accidentally break the build. Again, as this game and all of the others you've seen today are at very, very early stages of development. Um, so please, any bugs, problems or otherwise, do not hold it against the games as they are still being created. Um, if you want to hold it against me, I literally can't stop you. Oh, and as a terrible host, I forgot to play the trailer for Potions before we leapt into it. So I assume that will be uh, much like the crack into that ship. Aha! This must be the place. Found Granny's house. Uh, hello? Oh. oh, Luna, my dear, welcome. My, how you've grown. It's nice to see you too, Grandmother. Please, call me Granny. Everyone else around here seems to. Now, I understand you've shown some skill in the craft of potion brewing. I wouldn't exactly call it skill. I was trying to make some brown dye to colour a scuff in the door and it exploded. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Luna! Luna, you're doing me a damage. Exploded, you say? Yes, I blew the back porch right off the house. Mother was so mad. Don't worry, I can paint that crack in the door, no problem. Boom! What did you use? What did you have around the house? Sorry, sorry, I'm getting meta. Wonderful, dear, you must have a talent. Go on, tell me how you made this explosion. Well, there were some mushrooms around that were the right color of brown, so I ground them up, and it was too light to match the door. So I added a bit of ash from the fireplace until the shade matched, and then I didn't have a brush. So I found a feather to apply it, and bam! It blew up the second it touched, the fe it touched with a feather. Sorry, it just saw Vanderby saying, brown dye go brrr. Oh, a small explosive potion. Marvelous, my dear. You do have a talent. Now, go collect a mushroom, ash, and a feather. You should be able to find ash and feathers at McDonald's farm, and there should be plenty of mushrooms on the edge of the deep, dark forest. Off you go. Can't I just use ash from the fireplace? And wreak havoc on my own supply? I fear not. Go search out these ingredients. Come back when you've gathered them all. I find character voices tend to change. Uh, also, um, as I assume this will be our base of operations, uh, we can interview... Uh, here's what we can do. Crafting, 
get some tips from Granny, check our equipment, etc. But, as we have limited time for our adventure, dear friends, we shall leap forward. Mary Muffet, we meet again. Sorry. Uh, Arthur Cockleaf said, did she just mix charcoal, saltpeter, and sulfur? Accidentally, yes. Well, I believe. I can't I can't speak for the game. Uh, also, if you check out the, uh, the, the plant behind the house that looks like it's ready to eat your ankles off. Um, okay, so Mary's like, whoops. Oh, whoops you. Dropping all of your supplies here. Oh, can I help you? Could you please help me collect these herbs? I'll pick your herbs up for you, but I'm not giving them back! Sorry, the game's just taking us through, like, you know, collection of crafting elements. Uh, Mary Muffet says, thank you so much. Please keep them and put them to good use. Alright. Now, usually this would be the point where the game takes you through the, the early base elements of crafting and tutorials. But, uh, something you may or may, know, may or may not know about me. I'm actually a wizard. And wizards don't have time for learning. So in the final version, there'll be uh, more elements here. But thankfully, the devs provided me with a, with a cheeky Twitch shortcut. So that golden Baba Yaga card's gonna get us past... Wait. Was it up this way? Oh no, it's around the other way. Okay. This golden Baba Yaga card's gonna get us right into the mischief. Haha. Oh, Beardora said the plant is behind my face. Oh, it was this plant down here. It's like it's gonna bite my feeties off. Right. And just like a wizard, I've got a magic stone. Use the magical twitch shortcut to skip the mechanics introduction quests. Heck to the heck yes. Granny's like, welcome home, my dear. Did you deliver the potions? Uh, yes, I delivered both of them. The innkeeper said he would have sent payment later. He's dealing with Prince Charming. Ugh, that obnoxious hothead is harassing other people, is he? Let me add water bomb recipe to your recipe book. Let me use it to cool hotheads like him. Your next task is quite beyond our brewing abilities, however, for there's another item which every witch should carry. You'll need to visit my old sister in the deep dark forest. She shouldn't be too difficult to find. Just look at the hut perched atop a pair of chicken legs. Baba Yaga. Uh, excuse me, a hut on chicken legs. That's the one. Take a handkerchief. I've wrapped up a bit of ham and some sliced bread for you. A snack to keep your feet light on the journey. Okie dokie lokies. Um, so... Should have some items. Okay, here we go. So we've got a couple of we've got ten small explosion, potions of flame, water, confetti, just because. Uh, a better explosive potion, minor healing, greater healing, and a lot of water. Right. Satchel's refilled. We are ready to go on a stroll. So now we've gotten to the core crux of it. It is worth saying that again, one of the things that I really liked about this concept was the idea of taking a, a crafter, of uh, taking someone who's, whose profession is not sword murder, and taking them through this kind of adventure. So I believe we're going to head to the deep dark forest now. That's where we went. I believe this is the way to the deep dark forest. Ah, oh, no, here we go. And as someone who enjoys an inordinate amount of fantasy games of different genres, I feel that any experience that sets out to tell these stories from a different perspective is one that I wholeheartedly want to embrace. <laughs> Beodorus is pointing out that they love this game already, but who thought it was a good idea to let Will have explosives? Haha! <laughs> the show's already started. You can't take them away from me. Uh, IGDA, please do not take these explosives away from me. So we've got minor explosions now. If I remember correctly, there's a, a wind up and throw to these. Ooh. A bundle of ivy can cause irritation. Andy? Nope. 
don't believe I have anything yet to cross that. I need like a levitation or something. Uh, Catbit says, like the Altella series. I mean, I don't think that's an unfair comparison. The, the observing the, the fantasy world from the perspective of others. And I'm not... Uh, this isn't me dissing on the, the Witcher 3s and the fables of this world. I love those games wholeheartedly. But... Again, we... Oh. Alright. Hi-ho, grenade away! Eh! Witches get it done. Um, sorry, I wholeheartedly love those core fantasy experiences. It's just, we live in an era now where there's more space and room and discussion for nuanced titles, especially nuanced titles around experiences that, I'm not stepping on that bloody thing, that we know and love. Now, I'm also a monstrous sucker for crafting in any game. So, a game where crafting is not only the, the core mechanic, but also your main interaction method, works real well. Alright. Hang on. Potion of Flame, you say? Ah, do can Oh. Alright, we're good, we're good. Used a lot of fire. Uh, so, Stansworth says it's very cool and Zelda-like. I loved how it was like... Uh, I always pronounce that game wrong. The one where you run a shop. Uh, Resetia. Resetta? I called it Racketeer for like three years. Um, I, they too were obsessed with the idea of making uh, making potions game for many years. Well, and now it's, it's a thing that is happening. Uh, Shanyang, a massive one-legged bird. Shanyang brings rain by dancing. Now, obviously, that's placeholder art, and later on we'll have a, a piece in it. Water crystals. Lovely. But as this initially doesn't focus on the process of running a business, it adds a... Oh, no, you can get fed me. Barber Chuck! <laughs> no, we're alright, we're alright. Slightly singed by my little uh, explodey potions. We're fine. Um, I found that... I found that those games had you so focused on profit rather than crafting that oftentimes it, it led at least me personally to focus on the most profitable means, you know, like min-maxing your shop, essentially. Whereas this asks you to be a crafter, at least in the initial. I really like that. Oh! And to Catfish, that's a very good example. Um, the Secret of Evermore. Okay, question. Is this kitty friend or foe? Please don't eat me. The kitty is friend. Kitty says, Meow. The ragged cat stares up at you imploringly. Its ribs are almost visible through its mouth. No! Alright, friends, I'm a sucker for animals at the best of times. Of course, I'm gonna give that cat all my ham. Oh. I will level with you, though. Ham should not crunch. Oh, okay. The cat speaks. <laughs> Curse says, Thank you, miss. Hunger truly is the best spice. Oh, that hit the spot perfectly. In fairness, if I was a speaking cat, I would use cat puns almost exclusively. Uh, and Luna, much like us, is like, you can talk? It is rather surprising, I admit. I've been told it's one of my most unfortunate skills. Oh, okay, cool. You're a magical transforming cat. Kitty. Uh, my name is Helios. What brings you this deep in the forest, young one? I was sent to, to carry favour with the woman that lives here. You're either very bold or very foolish. Definitely very foolish. Uh, but one good turn deserves another. I shall accompany you. Turn around. Bow low. Uh, 
uh, bothersome hut. The old crone has a visitor. Go! Oh! Okay, that was very loud for me, and I hope that wasn't too loud for your lovely selves. Oh, Helios and Luna. The sun and the moon. Uh, Riku, that would have gone straight over my head if you hadn't pointed that out. Hmm, it's just out of my reach. All right. The old gate squeaks and groans before uh, sticking in its hinges. Oh, uh, what have we got? Water spear, confetti bomb. Let's try confetti. The confetti did not help. What if we tried slightly more confetti? Nope. Although I did just realize that throwing water on rusty things doesn't help it in the slightest. Oh, of course, the bloody oil can. Now, hopefully I can blow up the rock without shattering the oil can into a thousand pieces. Politely taste my Hadouken! Okay, there we go. Hinges oiled. And again, friends, we're very, very early in the game, so it's very, very rudimentary, like, uh, potion puzzle solving, but I like it. It's not, ah, you can't get over this waist high gig. Go murder a great big goblin and steal his key. Like, excuse me, um, why can't I climb over the gate and why can't, yeah, you know what I mean. Why do I have to murder a goblin? How did he get the key? How long has he had it? <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear, are you okay? What's wrong? I... This, uh, <laughs> uh, comfort the servant or ask where the homeowner is. Well, let's see if he sounds like he's got hiccups. There, there. It can't be so bad. Here, take my handkerchief. <gasps> oh, thank... Ha-ha! <laughs> thank you ever so much, sweet thing. It's so rare for a kind soul to venture into my domain. <laughs> Surprise, Baba Yaga! Who, who are you? Are you my grandmother's sister? I'm called many things. But you might call me a Baba Yaga. The sister to all and to none. Well, to, to, pleased to meet you. Baba Yaga, my, my name is Luna. And I was told you could help me craft an item of great power. I know who you are and what you seek. But my aid is never freely given. I have a task for you. A task? Before I grant this boon to thee, you must gather these items three from Taco Bell. Sorry, sorry. I've, I seem to have a bout of the silliness at the moment. First, a branch of willowing. A branch of willow. Three, deep as shadow and bright as spring. A golden straw must next be won. The kind by fickle goblin spun. Then find the dust from fairy's wings and pixie's magic mushroom rings. Once these talismans you have gathered, return to me and hear my answer. For these forces you can tame, a witch's bounty you shall claim. <laughs> Sorry, I just assumed a laugh at the end there. And then cut down the largest tree in the forest with a herring. Thank you, Sadler. All right. Right, so now we have the cat Luna with us. Head out into the forest, dear friends. <laughs> All right. Excuse me, have any of you seen any? Uh... Oh God! Mushrooms! Sorry, that made me, <laughs> made me jump a little. I think under has done me a damage. Okay, so what have we here? Hmm. Line of water. Let's see if we can't throw some water on this, maybe? Hmm. We'll come 
back for you. I do to just a Paris. Okay, a Paris in the real world would be a horrifying part crab, part monster, all poisonous. One does not have a good time when encountering the Paris. That one, a potion of flame. Perhaps we can... Oh, I can't quite get the angle on it. Okay. Now, oh, Riku Kitty says teleport home. Oh, cool! I go to the other area. I shall, I shall. Sorry, Granny, no time, gotta run! Grasslands. Oh, the fairy forest, of course. Okay, this is where it. No. Fairy forest. Alright, this is where it starts kicking off proper. Ah! By the old gods and the new. Uh, I apologize, dear friends, that I have. I have come up to my time and I need to start showing you Epic Tavern. So, friends. This game is Potions, A Curious Tale. I believe that there is a Kickstarter link for this one. And if the fact that I've lost track of all time doesn't tell you that this is absolutely something you should keep an eye on, I don't know what will. And I tell you... No, Will! Bad Will! Stop playing! Okay. Let's, let's bring it on over to here. But again, I I really do want to recommend having a look at that one. I genuinely wanted to spend more time playing that. And now I'm like, Jones in. So I apologize that I didn't get the chance to show you a trailer. I will be showing that at the, uh, the end of today's adventures. It is worth saying as well that once we have done Epic Tavern next, we're going to take a little bit of time we're going to have a sip more coffee we're going to talk about today's game so if you have any questions that don't get answered throughout the course of today's show we will heck and be there for years all right all right so um i am informed that we have epic tavern on the line now i should here we go epic taverns trailer so do bear with me just a second dear friends because i want to get this um uh, I want to get this uh, downloaded so that I can show you. And then we're going to be talking to one of the team about this title. Um, this is a turn-based pub management game set in a fantasy world. I I had to re-watch the B-roll for this a couple of times. Because, again, as I guess has been the theme throughout all of the IGDA showcase, is that at first glance this seems like a very simple like management sim. But there is a depth and a tactic and a strategy to this game that is feckin' impressive. And I'm really, really looking forward to showing you. Alright, so speaking of showing. Now let's see if I can do this without blowing everybody's eardrums out again. Please don't be loud, please don't be loud, please don't be loud! <laughs> Okie dokie, Lokis. 
So, as we have uh, another lovely guest waiting in the wings, let us leap on in. Okie dokie, lookies. Okay, hello, hello. Hey, Will, how's it going? It is going lovely. Tomo, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I'm happy to be here. It's uh, my pleasure. Bear with me just a second. Uh, as I have been mostly uh, a catastrophe at uh, video mixing today, bear with me a second while I get your lovely B-roll up and running. Oh, no worries. I think people might notice that the uh, some of the gameplay in this video looks different from the one in the trailer. Uh, there's been a lot of changes since way back when we actually launched on early access. Oh, nice. Um, oh, I the right... Oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 um, please. These lovely Mother Hubbards probably have had enough of me nattering incessantly, and um, we are here to talk about Epic Tavern. So, uh, Tomo, would you like to introduce yourself very quickly, and then let's get into showing people the pub glory, because uh, I, I fancy a pint at this point. Nice. Yeah, I know the feeling. Um, my name is Tomo Mori Waki. Um, I am one of the co-founders of Hyperkinetic Studios and the, I guess, title-wise, design director, maybe, for Epic Tavern. And um, Epic Tavern, should I go into a brief oh, explanation? Absolutely, please. So Epic Tavern is a uh, kind of a hybrid game that combines kind of a procedural storytelling uh, with uh, business management or kind of simulation. Uh, you run a tavern set in a fantasy world, and uh, the patrons that come to that tavern are, you got to think of them as the prospective great heroes of the land. And uh, who ends up being the, the, the critical players of the story of this world uh, ends up largely in your hands, depending on who you befriend and whoa, who whoa, you call whoa, whoa, whoa. So you're telling me that as a bartender, I basically get to play hero maker. If I serve the right pints to the right people, I can shape this land. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think a, a big part of the thesis of this game is really like a, uh, a story is really doesn't really exist without the characters that that kind of go through it. And uh, so by having the player be have all the agency over the who, uh, the story that emerges ends up becoming one of the players choosing. That's fucking glorious. Sorry, because I, I I made little notes on everyone's games today that I wanted to talk with their varying creators about, and I I had like a, a snappy one liner prepared for you about how this is the this is the game that is the simulator to the start of every D and D campaign. You know, the shadow Absolutely. figure smoking a long pipe in the back of a tavern, looking shifty. Except for you've actually done that, and you are shaping the world with creating heroes. Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, uh, from a very early point in in kind of developing and uh, promoting the idea, um, I think that we've had difficulty kind of conveying the degree to which uh, ultimately Epic Tavern is like our PhD dissertation on game developers trying to disassemble storytelling. Uh, and we just, you know, it's obvious to make use of a fantasy world and mm -hmm. the fact that so many of us are role-playing game nerds uh, you know, we all, not only do we all have experience doing that, we know that so much of the audience has that experience as well. That's fucking cool. Okay, I do need to talk about the, the, the core mechanics of this, because when I first heard the pitch for this, it just, it made sense. You run a tavern, it's in a fantasy world. We've, we've seen a lot of management sims. There have even been a couple of games that have, have touched on the idea of running an inn or a tavern. But the thing that, also, that mug is glorious. Um, the the thing that really struck me was the manner in which this works. You, it's turn based. There's you serve rounds to your patrons, and the skill in which you serve them affects your your overall um, uh, income. Uh, am I correct in assuming that? Yeah. Um, so you know what you're going to get in the tavern social phase of the game is uh, a bunch of patrons in a in a 3D depicted bar and. Uh, there's a kind of a mini game mechanic where, that we like calling drink chain combos. Uh, and it's kind of a light duty system that you kind of interact with. And we kind of think of it as the foundation upon which the other interactions kind of get to happen. Uh, we want to create a vibe of socializing and serving drinks 
characters do get uh, can drink too much and pass out, and you see little bubbles or stars above their heads or Z's, depending on how much they drink. I feel like um, I'm being very much called out here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and um, Rhymes and Moose just added, toss around to your patrons, and now I'm hearing that playing on nice. loop in my head. Thanks, Moose. <laughs> I'm trying to be a professional here. <clears throat> Sorry, please continue. Well, I mean, I think that I think that conforms to being a professional in this context because of what true, we're talking about. <laughs> um, and uh, so you were saying that that's just one part of the experience. So alongside running a tavern, what are some of the elements of this title? So the game really flips between two major phases. Mm -hmm. There's the phase in the tavern, and that's the place where you get to know characters. That's the place where you can recruit them onto your roster. It's the place where you're making money in the conventional light business sim. Uh, but then the second phase, well, you also uh, acquire, you get the rumors that turn into quests through that through that phase as well. Okay. Uh, but the other phase is really, you can think of the other phase as the story adventure phase. And so that's where you take the characters that you've recruited uh, and combine them with the quests that you've um, unlocked or, or made available. And so uh, something you can kind of see a little bit yeah. of that in action right now on the B-roll is the, the, these four characters have been selected to go on this quest and uh, encounters are happening. And, uh, and the kind of... Um, there's a it's a it's a fairly text heavy game uh and the reason why we chose to go that route was because we wanted to create a universal encounter system one that could accommodate all the things that happen kind of in fantasy literature and tabletop okay. rpg experiences there are so many cases where you're kind of fighting against the environment uh socializing to overcome certain obstacles having to do puzzles or use your mind for various things and your typical game will tend to have like a, a strong and rich feature set for one of those elements of the game and typically it's combat um, and so we want to have a much more flat or even experience of, of depicting, you know, maybe chasing after your friends who've been kidnapped by orcs or, uh, you know, that this conversation with this person or this politician is very important to succeed at or that there's a puzzle here and that you need to solve the puzzle. Now, in our game, you don't actually solve the puzzle. Your characters solve the puzzle. They use their mind skills. And because we have uh, written text as our setups and resolutions for our encounters, uh, it can all use the same system. Okay. I mean, not to, not to speak for your game, but when I was watching some of the, the footage of this, the way it uh, appeared to me is, you know, you're playing, this, you're playing this tavern owner. You're there cleaning out a tankard as, uh, as a few heroes saddle up to the bar, and you're like, well, I uh, heard tale of a couple of... A couple of orc encampments up around the road. If uh, if someone could clear them out, there's probably some coin in that. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, say no more. Job's as good as a word, you know what I mean? But then what happens from there, if you are playing the, the role of this tavern keeper, while you get to roll for these characters, it's told back to you as the story of them. You don't personally run through... <laughs> don't worry about it. Um, you don't personally run through these dungeon adventures yourself, whereas your heroes do. Yeah, and in a lot of ways, uh, back, you know, early in development, we, we called the adventure mode kind of the FedEx package tracker mode. <laughs> um, uh, at least, you know, that's what we were kind of modeling it after, that you get yeah. updates about what the package is doing. <laughs> Excuse me, uh, this is the uh, Wizards Guild. You don't even pay in your feckin' dues. I heard you got a lot of wizards coming through your tavern. Oh, my God. <laughs> Um, Fuck it, wizards! It's so funny because I do a lot of dev streaming for Epic Tavern, and sometimes I'll just let it—I'll just let it pick up and let whatever's on the phone go while, <laughs> while doing the stream. It's a funny little moment. <laughs> you have. So one. wait, what was I in the middle of saying just then before that uh, disruption? You were talking about FedEx mode. Mm. Okay, yeah. So yeah, the idea—I mean, if you were to have a true singular perspective, then what would happen? What? It would have to be the owner of the tavern. But yeah. in a lot of ways, there are some esoterics in in how we've kind of devised the player's position. Um, I think in a lot of ways you can imagine that the game is um, you take tabletop mm. and players have a certain perspective and dungeon masters have a different perspective. And that we tried to kind of average those perspectives out to create a singular point of view that you get to navigate so that that's you a, get like a... That's a very good in a weird analogy. Way, I mean, a single player view of a party of players and a dungeon master all wrapped into a bubble because when you think about it like the the correlation between betwixt 
Dungeon Master and Bartender is very, very similar. Like, they're both trying to help a large group of people have a really good time. And they only try and kill them when they're being jerks, let's be honest. Um, <laughs> totally. actually, uh, so, uh, Wronghouse in chat was saying that the prologue is basically rolling up the story world for each playthrough. The results of the prologue ten years before your tavern opens determine the state of the region and the heroes that will be available to you. Is that is that correct? Because that sounds fucking yes. awesome. That sounds fucking cool! Is, he is the lead writer on the project. Right? Ah, right? Wronghouse, lovely to meet you. Um, the Wrong House, yeah, by that... the way, is a great name for a tavern. Um, uh, actually, to plug the writer, he, he it was a it was a it was a horror movie he made uh, 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 some time back. Why does that ring a massive bell? Anyway, we can we can talk horror stuff another <laughs> yeah. time. We're here to talk about uh, pints. Nice. Um, so yeah, that's this prologue quest is the way we start the game off, and mm. um, part of the idea is you want to start the game off with the storytelling part of the experience, just to get the players accustomed to the fact that this is fundamentally a storytelling game. Um, and uh, and also kind of give you an idea of what the mechanics are like when characters are really powerful and also walk you through a specific story that's going to have an influence over the course of the game. And so uh, a lot of the random results, well, random may not be the best word, but there is randomness, right? You can fail rolls. You might win or lose some of these encounters. And depending on the encounters that you win or lose, different settings will be um uh set for the for that particular so tavern's playthrough it's less of a uh success failure it's more like if we took richard garriott's old character creation system through like the avatar um but it's pissheads uh that would be a way of putting it right <laughs> yeah, yeah sorry forgive the terminology <laughs> it's i know exactly what you mean <laughs> this game speaks to me as a drinker this game speaks to me well, you know, I feel like uh, having uh, started up a, a video game startup, mm. uh, being a video game developer in general, or just maybe working in crea uh, working on creative slash entertainment stuff, and making a game about a bar, we had to do a lot of research. And, uh, <laughs> we had to do a lot of self-medicating. <laughs> um, I, I wish I had the connections to get you like a brand crossover with Hobgoblin Brewery. I feel that needs to happen. Holy moly! Yeah, um, write that just that word down, or at least very at least we'll we'll send them a steam key. Yes. Well, Catfish Water was saying, uh, "Are we giving Will a key?" I mean, I. Oh yes, a, absolutely. It's no, a game about running a pub. I know I'm abusing my power as host. I've been doing this entirely throughout today's, but fucking yeah, <laughs> I want to play this. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, um. So yeah, um, I'm. Do you know what? I'm going to give you the, the fluffy question that I've been yeah. throwing at all of my guests today. So, he has returned once more, Mr. Magical Moneybags, with his huge sack of Infinicash. He plonks it on down, it's all yours. What is something you'd love to add to this title? Money, no question. Time, no question. What is something you'd love to throw into this? I'm making no promises. We are well prepared for this question, because um, so much of our position about this has been develop this develop this do this exploration so that we can continue to do this exploration okay um and so uh the the we are basically in a mode where we're trying to get out of early access as soon as possible and to that effect there are some features that relate to this kind of like um camping survival that that relates to tending to the needs of the party as it travels along the road okay. including improvements to equipment um and then like some some a bunch of polished stuff uh so but beyond that the first choice, depending on how well it does once we come out of early access, is either very robust mod tools so Ooh. that we can start building a community of people like building their own adventures that they want to see through through this lens, uh, or to uh, it's it's a it's a, I like calling it a tip of the iceberg uh, feature uh, because we've been working towards it. Uh, character interrelationships, uh, there. It, you know, I was saying before how the story is really about who goes on it. Um, so one thing we want to depict is this idea that the events that you, the characters go through can fundamentally change their personality. And, uh, and the way in order for that to happen is, one, we need to have a personality system. And then, two, we need to give you a convincing reason why it changes. And then we need to give you feedback from that point forward that they're that 
that they've changed in that particular way. And so uh, that would be the other of uh, one of the one of those two steps would be the first uh, significant development efforts we roll into once we get these basics done. Indeed. I, I apologize for my uh, cheeky grin and I imply no relationship mechanics or things otherwise, but I had a sudden laugh that you as a very exceptional bartender getting heroes and adventurers drunk could be the reason why there are a lot of half orcs, half elves, half ogres nice. <laughs> uh, throughout throughout the lands. Um, I apologize for that crass joke. Um, well, you know, but it's not so much a crass joke, honestly. I mean, don't. I mean, I feel like I feel like Steam, especially, has been a uh, a big part in this. But like dating sims have really grown, and it's not it's not. It maybe it was never weird, but it's definitely not weird now. And I think that um, features in the game to handle relationships between characters. Um, I think that that we're we're totally into that, and I think that it's a a really valid part of an experience to give to the audience as well indeed and like if we're being honest you know taverns are very much social elements and yep oh uh, so the wrong house was throwing in another lovely example which i'd like to to read out uh that um there's an encounter that you'll sometimes hit in the prologue where a uh, a prison is being overrun by monsters and the guards have fled if you succeed in saving the prisoners including an infamous assassin um i don't know why i said it like that um uh, carver is so moved by the gesture, he turns over a new leaf, becomes a playable hero, but fail at that stage, you leave the prisoner to die. Carver survives and will come looking for revenge in your tavern. That's fucking glorious. Yeah, well, the moment we went down the path of a text-heavy encounter resolution system, yeah. and the fact that characters are a, a fairly lean uh, block of data, yeah. um, I mean, there are creative elements, and what you have to choose for that character. There's, there's that. That's the hard part, not the the data entry itself. So, we can create, we can make play all these tricks with the stories and the encounters that you embark on, and how they relate to the characters that are available. Yeah. Um. And so it's like, uh, much of the game system has been kind of is is built around this kind of essential smoke and mirror idea that allows us to trigger the imagination of the player. Uh, rather than kind of like concretely establish all this nuance and stuff as as having a, a true representation in the game, more often than not, that representation is in the imagination of the user. Indeed, I mean, if you don't mind me speaking as a as a content creator for a second, rather than as a, a game development survivor, um, <laughs> I, I'd love to see the ability to pull. Uh, so, so the the lovely individuals we have in chat, I'd love to be able to uh, to pull their names into this story. I don't know if that's something that's viable within your scope or otherwise, but I uh, I love the idea of seeing rhymes with moose getting passed out drunk on my bar, so that I might mock him shamelessly for months to come. So yeah, because we stream development pretty regularly, we get to interface with uh, Twitch audiences and oh, kind of get their their take on things, and very much uh, uh, the ability to rename characters and. Um, uh, eventually getting to the place where you could maybe pull characters in through like true Twitch integration. Uh, right now you can rename non uh, special characters. It, okay. It's hard to know which characters are custom or not, except there is one way to do it. Uh, characters that aren't custom built can be renamed and you can give them any name. That's the, the step one of the feature set. Uh, I think that uh, another thing maybe that lies beyond the either uh, strong mod tools or character interrelationship slash personality system uh, would be uh, true Twitch integration. Let the players, I mean, let the audience um, make choices for characters, make the audience give you, uh, you know, uh, maybe give you advantage on a saving throw. <laughs> oh, you know they're going to mess with me something chronic. <laughs> um, I did want to jump on a quick question. So Salem was asking, obviously making no promises. Uh, do you have a target for when you're hoping to leave early access? Yeah, I mean, our our hope. We've had many many targeted hopes for <laughs> leaving early access so far. Um, uh, the the studio. Uh, does a lot of client projects and that's what kind of allows us to continue working uh, so there is some uncertainty uh, we have described with uh, a fair amount of we're fairly concrete on exactly what needs to happen before we get out of early access and we think a reasonable time frame for that would be somewhere towards the end of this year or the end of the first quarter of next year okay uh, that is lovely so friends if you have any additional questions for timer we've got 
We've got seven and a bit minutes left for chat, so if you do have anything you'd like to ask, please uh, at IGDA in chat, because it makes it easier for me to see. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I've uh, again, I'm still curious as to why you chose to go for a turn-based system for the the taverns. Like, you know, why not emulate the the, the managers that uh, the management games that already exist? You know, uh, part of it was I. Th- you know, the original idea was intended to be a mobile game and okay. it was intended to be real time, you know, uh, kind of inspired by even even exploring some of the 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 real serious differences that mobile games have from your conventional PC or console games. Indeed. You know, uh, a quest could take five minutes, a quest could take 72 hours and the rewards would be different, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm. And you'd get updates about your party's adventure, you know, on your mobile device and kind of be able to kind of keep up with a bunch of friends and their stories, sort of. That sounds lovely. Um, if the mobile market wasn't so brutal for, for standalone titles right now, I'd love to see that. Um, yeah, and, and and a comment about the industry, actually, is that you need mm. to have some established power and strength with regard to monetization to really have a leg to stand on in the mobile market if you really intend to have any success. Or a crap so, ton of money. That also solves a lot of problems. It's But see, it's that success which gives you access to that crap ton of money. Yeah. Uh, and inevitably, you want to have you want to connect with a larger player in the mobile industry because they really do know a lot. Mm. And there's stuff that... You can, you know, you could spend a ton of time trying to master, but really, without the without the established departments that some of those mobile publishers have, you're really at a huge disadvantage. So our strategy is to make a game that meets really our our aesthetics and our knowledge and our own experience with games. So it's like a weird hybrid of CRPG and management games, which all of us play a lot on Steam. Indeed. And get it out on Steam. Steam's also a very, it's a great, still a great platform for uh you know well okay relatively a good platform for discoverability and um and there's you know it, it's the kind of environment that you can't add a lot of money to to change the results Indeed. and so it's fair to us little people it's a great place to start we explore uh early access get to know users and tune the game according to their experiences as well as ours and then once it's done and it's been successful if that comes to pass we could entertain a mobile game with a much stronger basis that would be lovely um uh, i mean you're already doing open development so you're already winning um so just covering a couple of things that catfish was answering uh, so you can't water down the beer beodora why would you ask if you can water down the beer you criminal <laughs> um uh, catfish points out you can change the prices you can raise or lower them uh, as you play, new drinks and food become available, including barbecue rat and dire yak kebabs. Well, cool. Now I'm also, hungry. Thanks, Catfish. Thanks. I think there's also a drink called the Morgue Arita. And it's interesting, you know, the... the, <laughs> no, the changing... I a, no, I need a second after that one. <laughs> I, okay. uh, changed... I have a oh, gentleman I know, and I will ask him to craft that, because <laughs> the name alone, it needs to exist as an actual drink. Um, awesome. Rhymes with moose, no vodkila. Um, <laughs> Rich B is informing me that I shouldn't ask what's in the margarita. <sighs> like a... well, he, as we kind of close up to the end here, uh, a tiny bit of trivia oh, please. is um, the, the text in the game is highly sensitive to the characters you bring on a, a given adventure. And uh, okay. so it can, it'll can it it'll branch or differ depending on the classes you bring amongst another, a number of other factors. And if you bring a necromancer along, you'll you'll get combats might might deviate from the original text quite a bit because the necromancer <laughs> might win the battle by beating one guy and turning it into a undead that then beats the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> on the plus side, though, if a necromancer wins and he brings like. 17 skeletons with him into the bar you've still only got to serve one person unless that's true although if the skeletons are drinking that's just all going to be on the floor so that's a lot to clean up well you know there's there's and that's the other nice thing about uh about the way we approach things we can we can say whatever we want we can have magic magic can be a part of a drink and uh maybe skeletons need satisfaction too indeed and i <laughs> sorry i hope you don't think that my jokes were kind of undermining it like creating a robust oh, no, no, system that allows you to have these kinds of experiences and tell these kinds yeah. of stories is no mean feat and uh, striking that balance between the the all text-based procedural and that uh that feeling of being part of the narrative is not an easy thing to create so i 
the fact that I could even dance around with these jokes while we're chatting is testament to the concept you've created. It's got some real weight to it. Oh, and, and my feeling is that, that, that the interactions on this stream have been super cool, and I very much appreciate your dancing around. And I don't think it was undermining anything. It was a ton of fun. This That's going to be my back of the box quote. Time. I quite appreciated his <laughs> dancing around. Um, oh, uh, Asari Greenfire was asking very quickly if this is if there'd be any tabletop components. Could this be uh, at some point a thing that one runs in a Dungeons and Dragons module? Yeah, I think any of the quests run are, are, are certainly that becomes an easy possibility. Uh, although we have had a number of conversations about what it would take to make like a, a board game version of this. And uh, it doesn't look the same necessarily because uh, when you embark to make that board game, you want to try to emulate the experience. And yeah. one of the easy things you could get a whole lot more out of is the players having having to take up the role of the characters and recounting the stories in the tavern. Because that's still a piece of the puzzle that we are trying to figure out a way to kind of capture that really kind of like warm storytelling around the around the fireplace vibe in the tavern is it weird uh, to say that i see it as kind of like a, a baron munchausen style game like each player plays a hero regaling their stories and the the bartender passes them narrative elements as they're as they're telling um sorry i don't mean to i don't mean oh, to totally, design no. your your game for no, you well what's funny is uh i mean do you do you know of the do you know the mouse guard i do there's uh they have a, a series of graphic novels for Mouse Guard which are so which beautiful. are which are set in the tavern. And the tavern owner has a thing where everyone tells a story and whoever tells the best story gets their tab for the year cleared out. Uh that was definitely a part of the inspiration for for, for the tavern experience. <laughs> oh heck, I am gonna steal that idea for uh for a day one day. Um um so yeah, sorry, I wanted to just jump on in because Rich B was adding they're always thinking about expanding the abilities for players to create modules, which is lovely. Uh, Burgo says, I thought you already cared about the kiddies. I mean, it's all fair. Um, to uh, Wraith's one of mine. And Wraith says, got to be careful about necromancers. They bring their own spirits. No, 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 Tomo, don't encourage him. Don't encourage him. <laughs> Criminal. <laughs> I got to use that one more often because I, I I try to keep keep up with all the right puns for the word spirits. You will, you know what? You're welcome to it. Um, <laughs> and no, there will not be land sharks in this. Actually, I can't speak for the dev team. They're, they're trying to bully me. So look, um, Tomo, we've we've run over slightly. Um, sure. Although we're into kind of the, the Q and A section, but I do want to thank you so much for taking the time to to chat with us. I am genuinely looking forward to getting hands on with this game. It. It is so many different things that I love blended together, but it has a, a spark and a, a specialness about it that I can't wait to experience myself. Um, nice. So, feckin' thank you. Awesome. Yeah, and uh, just hit me up anytime. Uh, I'm always excited to talk oh, about this. Um, and and um, where, should, where should people go to check out this title? So uh, we are on Steam Early Access. Uh, we have a Discord channel, discord.gg slash Epic Tavern, and we stream three times a week at Ep uh, Twitch TV slash Epic Tavern. That is lovely. Now, um, I mean, uh, Tomo and your lovely team, if you want to hang out and chat for a bit longer, basically uh, myself and Renee are going to gonna have a sip of coffee, chat about today's games, and hopefully throw out a few more links if you want to uh, to continue with this. But as the interview is coming oh, yeah. to a close, just do Excellent. thank you so much. And I love the idea of continuing to hang out. Yeah. <laughs> and I gotta say, it was very nice to meet you. And uh, I've been kind of like keeping up with the stream since noon. And I think you did quite a good job. Of, yes. And, and a sustained job, no less. Well, if I hadn't fecked up the sound volume for several times and forgotten the trailers, I'd be tooting my own horn left, right, and center. <laughs> oh, well, maybe, maybe in the mystical future, the next one of these will be in a real place where I can... Uh, mess it up in whole new ways <laughs> sorry, sorry oh yeah and then and then i can um uh talk your ear off on all the stuff i know about spirits oh. although everyone on our everyone on the team knows a lot about spirits including oh. necromancer spirits <laughs> the spirit spirits talk i, I think i'm there all right but again Tomo, thank you so much thank you all righty and dear friends that was epic tavern so uh, we have come to, not the end of our show today, but those were all the games that we got the chance to show you. So just to quickly recap, we've had Neko Ghost Jump, 
Kitty's Go Bounce Meow, but also Spooky Stab Murder. Uh, in the Black, mercenaries in the dark, gritty, realistic space dogfighting brutality. Uh, old World, um, Will Makes a Lineage and an Empire and was mean to the Danes. Um, we had Last Epoch, which was the one I described as the children of Diablo 2, but with sick time travel. They had a lovely community. Um, under World War I Boat Hell. <laughs> um, Externus. Actually, what was the full title of Externus? Uh, it was Externus, The Path of Solari, which was the narrative-based, tactical turn-based RPG with a corgi knight. Um, Potions, A Curious Tale. Um, the What If RPG But Not Stab Murder. Uh, and then that was Epic Tavern, a, a story-crafting pub game. Like, friends... I have been spoilt for games to show you today, and I, I genuinely mean that. I, I, you know, I'm just speaking on behalf of myself right now. I love indie titles. I love where we are with indie games as an industry because we can have this breadth and depth of incredible games that can take so many different views, that can do the things we know with a new twist or a careful blend or with something fresh in them. It has been my absolute honour to be able to show you all these. So, friends, I do hope you'll stick around for a little bit while we chat about them. If any of you... Uh, oh, uh, Tomo. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Will Overguard, and I'm on Twitch at Viking underscore Blonde. Um, like, I feckin' love this. And if we haven't met before, like, I was in the games industry for ten years before I turned to yelling at the internet to, to, uh, to survive. And it's been so wonderful to see this industry expand. And before uh, Renee comes on, I do want to say another thank you to the IDDA for giving me the privilege to host this. Um, I feckin' love indie games. And the getting to, to use that keen for good makes me all feckin' happy. So, yeah. Uh, oh, Layla says uh, that they are in uh, for old world questions. Let's, anyway, let's get Renee in and let us continue our conversations. Which is like conversations, but longer. Which is like conversations, but longer. Hello, hello. Hello. <laughs> so that was one whole showcase. That was one whole showcase. That absolutely was. Hello. I only blew everybody's eardrums out a few times. I'm so sorry. Ah, uh, that's all right. I think I think we all were able to uh, manage it. I think you were such an enthusiastic host that uh, they were happy for the the loud noises. No worries. <laughs> and um, if you would like me to show the trailer for potions, I do not mind doing that because I completely missed it. Uh, you're welcome to if you'd like. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. Um, so, I mean, I don't really know where to start. Um, I'm. I'm glad we opened with Neko Ghost because I feel that's one of those games that I could tell someone about it ten times and they wouldn't get how brilliant it is unless they see it running. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. It's one of those games where at the surface level you're like, oh, okay, it's a really cute looking platformer. But then it turns out there's so much more depth to it. Oh, God, yeah. And, I mean, maybe it's because I'm not a programmer, but the, the way in which one flits between the different views... Uh, melted my tiny brain. <laughs> it, it is really cool how they set that up. Um, in the black, I it's rare that I envy another person. I'm proud to say that I'm uh, an individual that doesn't uh, envy often. But the idea of getting to sit around a table and come up with real fake spaceships and then work out the real science of those fake spaceships and how they'd be built, like that's feckin' cool. I'd never considered... And, sorry. I was going to say, and they have some really heavy hitters on their team, too. Right? Yeah. I honestly could have annoyed our lovely guest about MechWarrior 2 for the rest of today's show. <laughs> oh, and um, yeah. sorry to interrupt. Uh, Burgos Games just put the Steam store page for Neko Ghost Jump in chat. Cool. Yeah, I think this has been a great opportunity overall to allow indies to share the awesome things that they are working on with the wider community. 
And I'm really glad that we were able to provide this opportunity and see so many awesome and really creative games. I know that you said it before, but I think you're right. Each of these games does something really unique, has a unique approach to uh, something that people might consider standard, that gives it such a twist, it makes it a completely fresh idea. Hells yeah, and it's just, it's a testament, because I feel so often our discussions about the state of the industry, the state of indies, we tend to focus on a few negative points, but looking today at the showcase of brilliantly inspired titles, it's hard not to smile, it's hard not to feel excited about this, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, no, I definitely feel inspired. Uh, for those of the, our viewers who don't know, I was running all the tech in the background. Oh, yeah. So I was uh, watching the chat, bringing in the hosts, uh, and everyone that I talked to was super excited. Most of the uh, people who were doing Q&As had been watching the stream. You know, Tomo said that he thought it was a, gr a great showcase, great games, and of course, a great host. Yes. So thank you all. Well, okay, and if we're, if we're doing this, and we are doing this, uh, so ladies, gentlemen, and individuals of all persuasions, like Renee organized all of this, all of our lovely showcase, all of our guests did all the behind the scenes. Literally, my job was just to be here and be enthusiastic. So I, I have to say, like Renee, thank you for having me on, and thank you for this feckin' great day. Thank you. I didn't have to run all of the hard side of tech, so I feel like I came out ahead on this. <laughs> um, so just jumping back into chat, so many of the devs are still hanging with us because uh, I'm going to guess uh, Dr. Uh, Vishineski was um, the lovely guest we had for Into the Black. He's saying, I'll chat MechWarrior Battletech with you, Will. Yours! <laughs> it's, uh, it's good to see those fans. Um... And we have a bunch of people talking about Old World. I do feel like both Potions and Old World, I needed like another two hours to really show the meat of both of those games. Yeah, even with the shortcut there, I know that there's a lot more to dive into. And in a game like Old World, I mean, that's that's a game that you play hundreds of hours, if not thousands. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't even get to like the family tree um, in, my, <laughs> in my test warm-up game. Um, I... I had a baby, and that baby was, ah, oh, that annoying baby. But then they grew up to be a general that commanded armies against the Numidian hordes. So you have this, like, Roman cavalry unit, and atop the, the mighty steed at the front is General That Whiny Baby. <laughs> Onward! Yes, yes, Emperor Whiny Baby, we shall follow you. Is and, that what you named your baby? Well, I was just trying to test the game as quick as to make sure it worked. And then I started playing it rather than testing it. And then many hours had passed. Wonderful. And it sounds like they'll be able to give some keys out to uh, to followers. So oh, that's lovely. So if you're interested in that more, I'm sure that, uh, that they can support you supporting your community. Oh, hells yes. And um, uh, actually, Layla J was saying that uh, they do have a Discord up. And that um, so if you want to know more on that, I just... I, I hope I made the point when we're talking about Old World that I've always loved classical history. But when I play classical history games, I have the knowledge of what I need to do to win because I know the history. You know, uh, like, um, I know that Spartans don't know how to fight on boats. Um, but if you don't manage your, your health and irrigation, they don't need to. They just starve you out till you get the plague. Um, I know that you never start a land war in Asia, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right, right. But having that historical grounding without historical geography adds this, you know, I must build a new empire. And I really love that. And it forces you to think about what caused history to right? come out the way it was, right? Like, okay, was was it so hard to win land wars in in the china region because of the population there or because of the rivers and mountains and then you're like oh the does that uh does that look the same is that gonna have the same threats no. indeed and kitty <laughs> <laughs> the true star of the show has arrived <laughs> um there's also no, that point dropped out of my head. Cat wins. Oh, uh, I know there was a question if uh, if potions, a uh, curious tale, can still be backed. 
it can't be backed right now. It is a, a funded game, but it will probably be released in 2021. So just follow that Kickstarter and you'll get those updates. Uh, Okie dokie. Uh, did I get the trailer for Potions? Ah, let me let me get that on the download while we're having a chat because I did want to show that. And I guess I need at least one more chance to blow our dear audience's eardrums. <laughs> I'm going to try not to this time. Um, Always a gamble, right? <laughs> oh, very yes. Um, I, I, it, for those of you that were watching earlier, basically I had everything set up, but it reset the audio um, as I was trying to play things. So I'm scrambling to find the right levers and switches. Um, but Potions is a title that you're directly involved with, am I correct? That, that is true. Yeah, that, that's my baby. It's so good. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it comes from basically the desire to create the game that I wanted to play growing up. I mean, obviously I enjoyed tons of games, but I was like, if I were to distill video games down into a perfect game for 12 year old renee what would that be that'd be potion to curious tale yeah and i i hope i said it during the the uh the playthrough i just i love the idea of approaching a fantasy world with a non-standard viewpoint i can love that um, Turn, yeah it turns out you're not a big guy with a sword who uh gets experience from killing every fluffy bunny you see right well the idea that if you murder enough tiny fluffy bunnies that you're suddenly strong enough to punch an ogre in the gob, that's always that's always blown my tiny mind. So and great that, hero that, warrior. How did you too, right? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, sorry, you were saying? And that you're a good person for doing that right? too, right? So how did you become Oh big girl? Yoys. Sorry. From your cat to my dag. River. River, come here. Come say hello to the entirety of Twitch. Uh, she's mad at me because she had to go to the vet this morning um so great hero how did you become the chosen one of the land well i murdered 1500 tiny adorable rabbits so that i had the strength to lift this sword um i'm sorry what <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry what uh yep exactly she's, she's mad at not <laughs> um but no um I want to jump back to Last Epoch, because that was one that, um, while the hook was time travel, there's one thing that I really wanted to chat about is titles we've seen today where you can see the art and the craft in it. Like, while Last Epoch does have its time travel mechanic for telling its story, um, it is a game which is looking to do something very specific to an artful degree. It is not looking to be a... I'm going to say it again for those of you keeping track. A Diablo 2 successor that also has, I don't know, a dating sim and uh, spaceship management as well. It is seeking to be a very specific kind of experience and do that great. And I love that we have a space for games like that. That wasn't really a Absolutely. question. I'm just making statements now. <laughs> and, and that game looks so polished and, right? and gorgeous. I know that they were like, we just want more art and more art. I'm like, it looks freaking gorgeous especially for the size of your team and for an indie team it's, it was absolutely mind-blowing just uh not only the character models but all of this the special effects and spells and environments it looks wonderful right uh, although um a couple of people uh, pointed out so team beat boop on the rabbits comment pointed out population control question mark <laughs> um it's, it's the emu war all over again um and uh, Tomo was adding, you know, like when Claudia takes the life force from a baby deer. <gasps> um, and yeah, I will say Last Epoch did feel, and I mean this with love and respect. You know when your friends like, oh, I drew this thing and it's incredible. It's gorgeous. And I, I'm really, I'm not really happy with it. You know, I think I could do better. And you're there physically blown away by the, the craft. It felt a little like that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think they really have a gem there. And there, there was a lot of um, variety in the just not only genres, but the different art styles of these games. And I thought that was really cool, too, to not only see games across different genres, but games across different art styles as well. I mean, with uh, In the Black, you had super realistic looking space graphics. And, you know, they were talking about how they even designed 
the um, the spaceships themselves to be very realistic in right. terms of truly what physics would be working in space. And then you have Neko Ghost Jump, where it's super, super cute. Uh, and then you have, you know, more of the top-down style with all of the different types of art from uh, Last Epoch to Old World. And I, I just got a total kick out of seeing all of those. Feckin' right. And it, it did not take me more than a couple minutes to find, like, the, the, the little... The, find the gems in each of these games. Um... So that was. Oh, I do have Externus B roll. All right. So I want to chat about Externus because this art style is feckin' cracking in a homemade engine, no less. Of yeah, it's really impressive. This whole like 2D, 3D blend. And I don't feel like I have the, the right descriptors to discuss how this looks and feels. Do you know what I mean? It feels storybook coming to life i think that's it right yeah. I, I think that they have you know as they said they were they weren't trying to go for an anime style but it's still very much a, an illustrated um characterized style and putting those types of characters in 3d worlds makes it feel like a story is popping off the page in front of you that's and a of course, way of putting it style telling that works as well I realized my camera just stopped. One sec. <laughs> well, thankfully, it stopped on a on a smile. So you you're good. Um, yeah, as Trevor was saying, definitely storybook coming to life. No, that's a great descriptor. God, I spent the entire time talking to Trevor, desperately trying to find the words to that. And as we can see here, like you know, it's not like with some isometric games where you just have like four set camera views. Like you can do full smooth rotation. And feck if it doesn't bring this whole thing to life. Yeah, yeah. I think that having that control of the camera really does make it feel a lot more real, like tangible real, um, which, which does a great thing for immersion. Indeed. I am, however, not going to apologize for bringing up the Corgi Knight as much as I did. You can't put a Corgi Knight in your trailer and not expect me to talk about it. I feel like a lot of, or many games have just one thing that is so awesome or so adorable that you just want it to exist in real life. Oh, like, yes. I need a night figurine. Yes. I need a Helios plushie. There are just some things that I want to exist in my physical space because I appreciate their design so much. Weirdly, they bring me joy, right? Hells yeah. Weirdly, um, for Neko Ghost Jump, I want a little diorama of like granddad pushing your character off the cliff as the explosion's coming down and there's the love of your life being sucked up as the shell's coming in. Like, obviously this isn't a magical world where that team wouldn't have to pay for manufacturing costs and things like that to sell one to me. The money bag guy, right? Money bag guy's back. Um, I also, I find that's a really interesting question, not because I'm trying to trap devs into promising things in the future, but like... Game development itself is the OG management sim. You only have so much time and so much money and choosing what you do and don't create. That's the that's the art and craft of game development, right? Yeah, absolutely. And Magical Money Bag Guy changes that dynamic and allows you just to just to go with the creative decisions. And I I wish all video games had infinite money. I I guess I wish all video games had infinite time. Ooh. Money bag guy is good, but time bag guy, now that's my buddy. All right, but I I don't know time bag guy that well. <laughs> I mean, I think he was at like a, a GDC mixer, but he had like a whole group of people around him. So I didn't get the chance to talk to him. That would explain how the time flows oddly at GDC. It really does. <laughs> GDC is time tr truncation. All that time being exchanged. Um, so... Like, as we were saying earlier, like, Potions was your... Uh, Potions was. Potions is your project. And you were looking to create what, what like, Tiny You would l have loved back in the day. Uh, are there any other elements that I didn't cover from that game that you'd like to, to chat about? Because we got time. Oh, I, I feel bad um, taking, taking the time because there are so many other great titles. Um, I guess I can say one thing that 
perhaps the audience noticed is there's a lot of fairy tale characters. Yeah. Um, at the beginning, you run into a lot of uh, traditional European fairy tale characters from Miss Muffet and Baba Yaga yeah. uh, to to many others. There's Prince Charming as well. Um, but the different sections of the game actually draw in from different areas of the world. Oh, nice. So you run into um, Tanuki and Kitsune and characters from Journey to the West <laughs> and who would go into the desert and you're dealing with uh, genies and the, the Sphinx and, you know, uh, you know, one, 1001 Arabian Nights kind of stuff. Uh, and I think that something that's really magical is that you can explore through this game and you just learn so much about other cultures while getting to, you know, enjoy enjoying crafting and enjoying puzzle solving and, you know, exploring that world. But it sort of makes you a, a more rounded person in the in the process. I mean, that's fair. Oh, I do have the trailer downloaded. So, um, dear, dear lovely viewership, will you forgive me if I just throw up a trailer wholesale at this point? And try not to blow everybody's eardrums out the back. Uh, again. <laughs> It's, I know I'm apologizing a whole bunch, but I'm desperately hoping I get invited back if we do another one of these. Um, oh, absolutely. You've been amazing. Oh, and Aldous was saying, we've never seen Time Bag Guy and Money Bag Guy in the same place. Ah. Aldous makes an excellent point. That's that's the GDC party we need to be at. Maybe if they're in the same place, it has some like catastrophic effects on the universe. So. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, like it's a... Uh, like a, a reverse end of magnets effect. <laughs> exactly. Oh, uh, sorry, I was asking if there'll be any Celtic influences in potions. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they're they're already written, so they will be in they will be in there. Uh, all right, no one's told me no, so I'm going to throw up the potions trailer. <laughs> I'm in charge of the show. Nobody can stop me. Let's try not to blow everything. <laughs> Come close, my dear, and listen well to this, the curious tale I tell. If you conquer tasks momentous, you'll be more than mere apprentice. Traverse hills and frozen glaciers over pathways fraught with dangers. I got a broomstick layer! far in search of splendors, curious. And other tricks. You'll gather toadstools, bits of newt, berries, thyme, and zacum fruit. Some salamanders and fish. Bright scales of dragons, spiders silk. Inside deep caves and wicked forests, you'll fight the dangers right before us. Battle beasts and monsters rampant. Decipher charms and dark enchantments. When their secrets you have learned, a potions master will return. They'll speak your name both far and near. A tale of witches you will hear. I knew Miss Muffet was evil! I knew it! Like, I will accept my gold star right now for calling it that Miss Muffet was evil. She's not evil. <laughs> um, not. Spoiler, she's not evil. Yeah, and uh, MDH and Peoples, I do apologize if that blew eardrums. I did my very best there to get the, the sound down as quick as. Um, and so I tell you what, as, as I've got you as my guest... Um, what would be your Mr. Moneybag's answer? You know, he's there. He's got that big old sack of cash. Infinite cash. What would it, what would be the one thing you'd like to add to potions given that amount of, of monies? Um, I think that I would just build out these sections in between the story parts more and polish the art. Okay. Uh, really, it's... As a side project, it's just taken a really long time. Um, but with extra money, I could hire extra people to do that work, and it would allow for more flexibility to flesh out the game even 
deeper um, because I think that the main quest line is, is really fun for people to go through, but what makes it's so magical is all of the little side things outside of that, you know, stumbling upon burnable bushes and then a card behind it or stumbling upon an ancient ruin puzzle that you don't have to solve. But if you do, you get to unlock new secrets. Oh, that's fucking cool. Um, okay, so continuing our, our rundown of all of these lovely titles, because we were just talking about Externus and Potions. Um, now, I know we just had them on, but feck it, epic, epic Tavern. Like... I love epic tavern i i own epic tavern i've played epic tavern it is such a fun game oh, i am genuinely looking forward to playing it because i realized after speaking with homo that it reminded me a lot of um uh was it a uh, knights of the oh knights of pen and paper in this sense that the story is told in uh, a manner as to give you the most amount of of experience kitty <laughs> Sorry, I'm legally obliged to acknowledge the cat. Uh, as to give us the most amount of story, that most bang for buck in tale there. Because uh, like I said, I'd written down that I was going to make a joke about having the, the sketchy man in the back of the tavern. But it's literally that as a fully fleshed out game with all the stories that spark from this tavern. Like, what's not to like? Yeah, I mean, it, it's so great that you sort of get to be a passive mastermind in this world and then see everyone else's experience and sort of, you know, play with the strings uh, and, and push the forces to make the world a better place. And that's fucking cool. Um, I've often, uh, I've often joked with myself that had I had I failed entirely in the video game sphere, I just wanted to open up a tiny pub somewhere. I've always loved the idea of uh, of sharing and telling stories, and. <laughs> Two cats and a dog. You are winning. Uh, sadly, I don't have my uh, my plethora of guinea pigs to to show off right now. Um, but uh, next if, time, next time, next time it'll be the IGA IGDA Indies and Pets Showcase. How does that sound as an idea? Yeah, I mean just... they have the puppy bowl. We could have something like the the indie bowl, complete with actual animals. Why don't we have an indie puppy bowl? Apart from money. It's yeah mr moneybags needs to come by for that seriously i will this like next real life gdc i will find him we'll get conversation i'll be like puppy bowl that's what indies need and one thing that i also want to note with epic tavern yeah. is something that i really appreciate with about it is sometimes when you're doing these management sims where you're like controlling groups of people and sending them out yeah let's say a dungeon adventure where it is terrifying and they die or get are harmed and you feel bad about them um in epic tavern it has such like a jovial take and the characters are silly that you're just like oops indeed though i sadly <laughs> wow. must inform you that you're uh, the you had too many cats on screen and it has locked your your webcam again yeah but whilst you're doing that little reset no you're right like it does have this 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 spark and this humor about it which i really love don't get me wrong i feckin love darkest dungeon like i've i feel like i feckin bathed in that game but the thing is you can't really do whimsy in darkest dungeon whereas you can no, you no, can really... start with whimsy and go dark it's hard to start with dark and go like even the jesters in darkest dungeon are haunting Yep, yep. And that's the tone. I I prefer lighthearted things myself. If you couldn't tell from the writing and potions, really lighthearted, really kind of fun, tongue in cheek. Oh yeah. Uh, especially with 2020, I feel like I need more lighthearted things in, in my in my world. Indeed. We were discussing this like earlier during the uh, during the pre the pre-show that, you know, Animal Crossing Fall Guys, like these have been great titles that have made made things better for everybody especially especially given the current state of things the very reason why this is being hosted from my back bedroom yeah yeah um i think i think that's just the great thing about video games in general is how they can bring people together help people through things you know not only are there serious games that can help people learn how to do cpr or mm. um teach people interesting and useful skills but there's community games and there's also games that just 
help you feel better with life. Whether that is scaring the bejesus out of yourself with under because that makes you happy, or if it's getting lost in playing uh, space combat or some fantasy simulator. Oh, indeed. I oh. think that 2020 is the year for games because it is one of those few things that we can always look to fondly. Very yes, very yes. Um, actually, I did want to touch on Under because I realised in our little in our our post show recap with Will and Renee, we have not talked about Under. And is it because it's too scary? Oh, I fucking did. It's also because like I have a fear of open water and stuff, so it combines those two. And making you look at a piece, an object in the world that says "Don't turn around," you're like, "You bad word." You know I have to. Um, but I did mean what I said, which is that um, games, especially horror, do allow us. Um, even though they're crafted to scare the, the hot heckity heck out of us, um, they do allow us to do a certain amount of empathy. One of the things I noticed is, and I don't know if this came across in the stream well, a lot of in-game assets were seemed to be like pseudo-realistic elements taken from World War One, like curving this little horror element around, and it started to imply this huge gangling figure, you know, was someone uh, who had suffered horrific injuries and lived during the great war but the construction of the boat and how it worked it doesn't adhere to logic or physics so is this taking place inside our character's mind are we the ones suffering these things is this our character processing the thing is i touch wood uh myself and all of you watching hopefully we will never know those horrors but giving us a way in which we can understand and empathize with that whilst possibly scaring the pee out of us like that's a power that video games have a lot of yeah, other I... mediums ask us to observe but this asks us to experience i i often say uh that that games are truly the best tools for creating empathy mm. and that a good game is designed around emotion and invoking emotion. I think those go hand in hand. Yeah, I know we often focus on did a game make me cry as a as a as a bullet point, but you know, did a game make me unsettled? Did it make me nervous, hopeful, joyful, heroic? These are these aren't the tales which we observe as others. These are our feelings and our experiences. I love that. Sorry, I just yeah, kind of I've... just saying it at you now. I apologize. Oh, yeah, I was just like, yes. Yes, I agree. Completely. Uh, a Beardora was also pointing out that um, they feel that there is a newish trend of games where you have an epic story, but you're not the main protagonist. I think pertaining to uh, Epic Tavern and to an extent, well, okay, no, Potions, you're definitely the, you're definitely the hero, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, it's a trend that I really enjoy. Yeah, I mean, I like anything that breaks the mold and certainly not playing as the main character is a great way or the main hero is a great way to to break that mold um i think it it lets you expand your idea of these games and their genres right uh when you see a point of story like always through the same eyes the same set of eyes even if people change things it feels a little repetitive, but then suddenly if you're looking at it from a third person perspective, mm. it feels fresh and, and very different. Yeah. Oh, there was one other thing I wanted to, to talk to you about before we, um, uh, I, before we start bringing our, our wonderful, you know, showcase adventure to a close. Uh, I realized that I did not introduce the IDDA or yourself and your role. That that's okay. I, I can do that. So, so uh, thank you all so much for watching. This is the IGDA Indie Showcase. The IGDA is the International Game Developers Association. We're a nonprofit professional association whose mission is to support and empower game developers around the world in achieving fulfilling and sustainable careers. I am the executive director of the IGDA, Renee Giddens, and I'm so glad that we were able to put together this showcase and show off eight indie games who need, you know, who deserve all of the attention in the world. And it is my absolute pleasure to put together opportunities like this to shine a spotlight on game developers and the amazing things they're doing and working on. Yay! And again, like, fucking thank you for having us. Like, I... 
fucking love indie games, and anything that I can do to help them feels like I'm doing some good in the world, you know? Um, you are definitely doing good in the world. Thank you so much for hosting. So, dear friends, dear watchers, if you have any questions for myself, Renee, or for Renee's beautiful pets, now is the time to ask, as we'll be doing, like, final rounds of questions before bringing this lovely adventure to a close. Um, I... I'm going to be making a list of these games and annoying all of the developers because now I have their emails because I want to play these. You do. <laughs> I mean, thankfully, Old Worlds are full build, so I can just crawl into that one. Um, and Externus' demo is on itch, so I'm definitely going to get stuck into that. Um, actually, oh, okay, I said all of these games except for Under. I have played all of Under that I can and all of Under that I care to on this Friday afternoon, let me tell you. It's a spooky way to go into the weekend, certainly. Yeah. Although, I'm just having a quick ponder. Um, Potions X Epic Tavern when? You know, one game is about brewing concoctions you drink. The other is about drinking concoctions that you brew. I feel there's a crossover here. I think a crossover would be super possible. <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to talk with uh, Tomo and Richie and see about that. What is this, a crossover episode? <laughs> Yeah, you were mentioning something else before. What, Hobgoblin Brewery? Or... Oh, right. Um, there was a Hobgoblin pub near near me that used to be my local. Cleverly referred to as The Hob. But they are a brewery that specializes in very kind of like like dark fairy tale themed ales. It's very good. Okay. Um, I did notice that every game had a cow in it, except for, I believe, Externus. So... Oh, yeah. Unintentional theme of the day. Um, if I'd had the forethought to to realise that, I would have given everybody like a little bingo sheet where they could have ticked off spotting the cow. I feel like we should have gotten all the cow assets and made a pseudo cow level. Oh, really should have. Next time. Next time we'll know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Professional Kent says they missed the memo. Sorry. Uh, it's fine. It's fine. Um, you know, do better next time. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Like, you all aren't already doing enough making actual, literal video games. Um, oh, Catfish says, entirely possible. There we go, friends. We're making business happen. We're doing deals. Um, <laughs> You're going to get scared a lot. Uh, quite possibly, quite possibly. So, um, as we don't have any additional questions leaping forth, I think this is a lovely point to, to bring our adventure to a close. Um, I'm going to say again, Renee, thank you so much for, for letting me host this. Um, I want to say thank you to all of our development teams and another shout out to Neko Ghost Jump, In the Black, Old World, Last Epoch, Externus, Potions, Epic Tavern, and Under. Hunt down these games, have them wish listed, observe them. For one day, they may be yours. And for those of you who are looking to observe them, all of their links are down below. Oh, Made yes. It's easy for you. So <laughs> That's way more useful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, once again, thank you so much, Will. Thank you so much, viewers. This has been a great way to go into the weekend. I am so excited about all these games. And this was just super enjoyable. Okay. So, Renee, I'm going to throw these lovely Mother Hubbards to the stream over screen thank you all have a wonderful and exceptional weekend i have been will overgard otherwise known as viking blonde and i hope to see you all again soon good night